everybody, and welcome to the last City Council meeting of the year. So let's hope we conduct some really good business today and make a lot of people happy. With that, I am going to ask Gary Jenkins with the police department, and he's our chaplain there, to please come forward and um, do a prayer this morning. So I would ask all of you to stand. Morning, everybody. To Morning. our honorable mayor, Brenda Gunter, to the members of the city council and all department heads and guests here today, uh, Merry Christmas to you. Let's pray. Father in heaven, in the name of Jesus, we bow before you, the author and finisher of our faith, to say thank you for this day. We thank you for your grace, your mercy, your long suffering, and your patience. And Father, we ask you to bless this city council meeting today, that all business can be done in a way that will glorify you as we work together for a better community. I ask you to bless our honorable mayor, Brenda Gunter, to bless the members of the city council and all of the city department heads that are represented presented here today. And Father, give our citizens of this city favor and will ever be mindful to give you and you alone the praise, the thanksgiving, and the glory. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Thank you. With that, uh, we are going to ask Leslie Salas, who attends Cornerstone Christian School, and Kyler O'Neill, who attends Wall ISD, to come forward and lead us in prayers. I mean, it's the end of the year, I'm worn out, okay? So, we're going to do pledges now. Please come forward. I scared you, didn't I? <laughs> and we also, are they, the regional athletes going to do this with us as well? So, we need Sadie Marino, who attends Lee Middle School, to come forward, and Christian English, who attends Glenn Middle School, to come forward as well. Have you all practiced before you came here? <laughs> Do it together? Okay, well, someone's going to take the lead here and go. I'm going to put my hand over my heart, and we're going to start. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. We will now do the proclamation and recognitions, and Brent Casey, our recreation manager, will be presenting these awards for the Texas Amateur Athletic Federation. Casey, you're on. How are you? Good. You look great in red. Thank you. Appreciate it. So do you. Thank you. All right, good morning. I'd like to thank the mayor, Daniel, city, city council for allowing us to recognize these great individuals, some athletes and some other things. First, we have the TAF uh, President's Excellence Award. This individual is a recreation supervisor here in San Angelo, but is also very active within the Texas Amateur Athletic Federation. TAF President wishes to recognize him for his dedication and outstanding service to TAF flag football program. His willingness to continually improve flag football is critical in cementing the future success of the program. TAF President Excellence Award goes to John Henry Perez. Next, we have our local male athlete of the year. This young individual participated in flag football and basketball with the San Angelo Recreation Department. 
His, young, his youth flag football team won his 10U state flag football state championship under his direction as quarterback. This individual also plays many other positions and is an example to others on and off the field. San Angelo Local Male Athlete of the Year goes to Mr. Kyler O'Neill. Next, we have our local female athlete of the year. This individual plays first in every race she entered here in West Texas. She went to the state games of Texas and broke the state record for the 3,200 meter run. She also plays first in the 1,600 meter run at the state games of Texas. This individual also represented Cornerstone Christian School in the Cristobal Wall ASU Stampede Sonora Cornerstone Cross Country meets finishing first in every single race. Her most recent accomplishments include winning the first place in the Nike Cross Country Regionals, which was just a couple weeks ago. This young lady is also a talented artist, finishing second place in the Christmas at Old Four Con Show Art Contest for her age group. San Angelo Local Female Athlete of the Year is Miss Leslie Salas. <laughs> well, I'm quite convinced that you're going to win this one. <laughs> Next, we have John Henry. He's going to do a couple more presentations. Good morning. Thank you very much. Um, I'm going to be the, have the privilege to go ahead and uh, um, announce our regional athletes of the year. We're going to start with our male athlete of the year. It's going to go to Christian English. Now Christian English participated in youth flag football for the past six years. Christian's uh, youth flag football team has won multiple youth state flag football uh, championships. Now I, I believe talking to Terry, I think it's what four in a row. So congratulations. And um, now Christian's been the quarterback, running back, receiver, and defensive back for his Gators football team. Now Christian uh, leads by example, on and off the field. And I'd like to again congratulate Christian Squeaky English. <laughs> now for our female. It's going to go to Sadie Moreno. Now, Sadie Moreno had a great year participating in our youth basketball. Her team actually won the state tournament uh, this past year. She uh, competed in the youth, uh, excuse me, in the youth volleyball, and also did summer track for our program. Now, Sadie and her teammates, like I said, won the 10U Division II Girls State Tournament. Sadie and her teammates got third place in the state youth flag football tournament as well. Sadie ran in our uh, summer track program for the first time. And Sadie had prior commitments, so she wasn't able to participate in the regional track, tra uh, regional track meet this past year. But after talking to Sadie's uh, coaches, they informed me that she is a leader on and off the court, a team player, and never gives up and pushes her teammates to do better. And again, I'd like to congratulate Sadie Moreno for our regional athlete of the year. Now I got a few more awards that they, they go to some individuals and also to an organization here. So first of all, I'd like to give out the TAF Contributor Appreciation Award. This year's award goes to San Angelo ISD. Uh, for, uh, San Angelo ISD has supported TAF in the city of San Angelo. I'm going to say since the early 2000s, San Angelo ISD helps us with our city programs, for, um, with gymnasiums for our youth leagues in our regional and state tournaments that we host here. Um, they also let us use our, or let them use our uh, uh, stadium out there for our summer track program. Without uh, the San Angelo ISD support, we wouldn't be able to put on the programs we do for this, here for the city of San Angelo. And I'd like to uh, have two uh, people here from the athletic office, uh, Mr. Brent McCallie and Mark Baker, please come up. Thank you all very much.
Now, it's a great honor also to have two guys out here in the, in the audience that I'm going to give two awards to. Uh, the, uh, another contributor award is going to be presented to Tony Allen for sports official. Um, Tony's been calling for, you know, for the city for many years. Tony um, has been with our youth flag football, youth basketball, adult basketball official for about 15 years or so. Tony's passion started when coaching youth basketball in about 2002. Tony joined the, the local chapter and wanted to officiate our youth basketball program. Tony's, um, you know, started to be our head official, you know, so he's helped us out with many, many programs that we have here for our youth. Um, in the past five years, our leagues have grown, and Tony's been a part of that, helping us uh, get officials for our league. So I'd like to present this award to Tony Allen for the um, sports official uh, TAF Contributor Appreciation Award. Thank you. Finally, and I'll get off of here, uh, one more award for the TAC Contributor Appreciation Award is presented to Marty Lopez for a uh, youth basketball coordinator. Uh, Marty's been working for the city for about 15 plus years as a part-time uh, staff member. And Marty started a, a basketball program called the San Angelo Bulldogs. And about 12 years ago, you know, we, Marty and I sort of got together and, and started uh, coaching kids. Uh, for example, this gentleman right here, Jordan Manjadas, was probably one of the first ones we coached together. Um, but, you know, it's been time. And over the past five years, you know, Marty signs up about 10 to 12 youth basketball teams in our league. Um, you know, without Marty, the passion of basketball and getting these kids uh, started at a young age. And he's also had a, um, a handful of kids signed collegially to play out their college basketball. Um, again, I'd like to uh, congratulate Marty Lopez for the Contributor Award for, for this year. Thank you very much. Last award, I just want to give to the staff for the recreation division. For the last, this makes the fifth year in a row that we've made a gold member for TAF, which means how many teams we register for their leagues and for our leagues. So the fifth year in a row is great for the size of San Angelo because we're up there and we, that means we get more votes when we go to uh, try to get more state tournaments and different tournaments here into San Angelo. This is what that means for us, the gold level. So we're competing against places like Dallas and the surrounding areas and much larger cities, and we're even beating them with a lot of registration. So thank everyone for participating and thank my staff and Marty and Sandra back there as well for doing such a great job. So. We will now move into the public comment section of the agenda today. And what I'd like to do to start with is have Allison Struby come forward and she can give us just a quick update on um, our issues with the sewer line. <coughs> Good morning, Mayor. Good morning. 
Oh, is this one? Good morning, Mayor Council. Uh, we are uh, working on uh, at the uh, collapse of Houston Heart or our sewer main under Houston Heart. Uh, we have been cleaning the past few days. Um, the contractor did work throughout the weekend. Um, it, it, you don't see a lot of progress or you know a lot of movement out there because mainly just a boring machine uh, pulling those drilling rigs or drilling stem. Uh, through that existing pipe. So our goal is to get that pipe as clean as possible. They did deliver most all the uh, all the new um, Sorry, I just lost my words um, all the new material yesterday We are going to try to pull 20 inch fusible PVC through the existing line so that we do not have to bore a new hole is uh, Is the hope uh, we would set two new manholes in the right-of-way and outside the right-of-way? Um, connect it all back up and the goal is to have Mainly all the underground stuff completed before Christmas so that his crews could take off for Christmas um, and then get all the patching and everything like that uh, repaved um, and hopefully within one month from the time of the collapse be back up and um, back up and running in that area. On Oxford Street? Was there a water line that was bored into by? Uh, yes, ma'am. We did have a contractor bore into a water line, um, and we've been working to get that one replaced. We did have some customers um, out of water, I think, for a day or so last week, um, and so we had some leaking valves through the weekend. Uh, but we wanted to keep those businesses up and running through the weekend, and so we're working on those valve repairs today, or yesterday and today. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. Is there anyone else in the audience today who would like to come forward and add public comment? We Please state your name and address or your SMD area. Each citizen can speak just once per item unless asked to comment by council. Public comment is a three-minute limit unless extended by council, and a proponent or opponent has five minutes unless extended by council. Council has no obligation to respond to comments or questions from the public. Any response from a member of the City Council to non-agenda comments is limited to a statement of specific factual information, reciting of existing policy, and directing staff to place the subject on a future agenda. Please go ahead and state your name and your SMD area, your address. Uh, my name is Dermot Campbell. I'm at 909 Caddo Street, San Angelo, Texas. Uh, I am speaking today on an ordinance that would create a database for wage theft. What is wage theft? Wage theft occurs when employers fail to pay their workers their promised wages or don't pay them at all. It also includes workers paid less than the legal minimum wage, workers who are being cheated out of overtime pay, or failure to pay prevailing wage under the Davis-Bacon Act, such as school bonds or federally funded jobs. Wage theft undercuts responsible businesses and hurts working families by forcing them to face unexpected hardships. How big of a problem is wage theft? Wage theft is all around us. Millions of workers are robbed each year of a total estimated 35 billion, often forcing them to choose between paying rent or putting food on the table. One in five construction workers in Texas has, uh, has suffered wage theft, and nationally, 50% of contingent laborers have experienced wage theft. Who does wage theft affect? Wage theft cheats fa uh, Texas families out of hard-earned income and hurts responsible businesses who do pay their workers according to the law. Responsible businesses can't compete with companies who don't pay their workers and are forced to pick up the tab when unpaid workers fall back on public safety nets. Employers who don't pay their workers also don't pay taxes, which impacts San Angelo's tax rolls. Actions underway. The Texas Wage Theft Act empowers law enforcement across Texas to investigate wage theft under the Texas Penal Code Section 31.04. It closes a loophole in the law that allowed employers to get off the hook by partially paying their workers. It clarifies that criminal penalties can apply in cases of non-payment of wages. What is the next step? I am asking for the City Council to appoint a champion to help determine what steps we need to take to create an ordinance to establish a, da a database to control compliance. Pretty much with the time, I also would like to include uh, on licensing, but with the time I had, I am focusing on, on the wage uh, theft aspect of this, but I do believe a database 
could help um, not only be a buffer between the law enforcement and this, but could give people another outlet. Um, I know we have the Texas Workforce Commission, um, but a lot of those outlets there, uh, just because of funding and all that, they're, they're not very usable to people, and this would help set up another outlet that could hold bad actors accountable for their actions. Thank you very much. Is there additional public comment today? Good morning, esteemed city council mayor. I'm here with, with two questions. I have uh, heard in the news as you have, uh, that uh, New Orleans was, uh, had, is held under ransom, and uh, that's, uh, there's been five other cities, Lubbock included, I believe, uh, in this uh, situation, and I was wondering, what do we have in place to uh, uh, guard ourselves from this situation? Uh, the, I believe the water uh, department has been corrupted a little bit. I don't know anything about if this has happened to us already or not. I would sure like to hear some news about it. Maybe it could be put on the agenda. Um, the, the second thing um, is that uh, this um, the other affects our privacy and our and our pockets books. I wanted to say that, and I'll just forget. Leave it there. Thank you. Thank you very much. Any other public comment? With no further public comment, we will close the section of the agenda for public comment and we will move into the consent agenda. I will ask each council member if there's any item on the consent agenda that they would like to pull for further discussion. I'll start with Tommy Hebert. No ma'am, nothing. Tom? No ma'am. Harry? R. Item R. Lucy? No ma'am. Lane? No ma'am. And Billy. Item K. And K. And I am going to pull item N. With those items uh, pulled from the consent agenda, which are items K, N, and R. I would like to have a motion to approve the rest of the consent agenda. Do I have a motion? So moved. So moved by Billy, seconded by Lane. Um, any public comment on the consent agenda at this point? With no public comment, we will ask for a vote. All in favor of approving the consent agenda, say aye. 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 None opposed. Consent agenda, with the exception of items K, N, and R, have been approved. We will now go to item K, consider awarding RFBES-01-20 Chadburn Street Utility Improvements to Darnell Construction LLC in the amount of $2,371,700 and authorizing the city manager to negotiate and execute all related documents. You're on, Lance. Good morning, Council. Lance Overstreet, Engineering Services. Um, <clears throat> This, this particular line item is for uh, the utility, the city-owned utilities on our Chadburn project um, that you guys have already kind of pre-approved in terms of the different phases. Um, this project is going to actually encompass all of those different phases, and we're going to be looking at the infrastructure under that roadway in terms of water and sewer, and then also to some other communication stuff to reduce our aerial impact in that area there. And uh, so, um, Ms. DeWitt, was there a specific question that I can answer in, in regards to this? Um, a couple of them, Lance, thank you. Um, I was looking at the report to council where we included a 5% contingency mm -hmm. over um, their bid amount. And in their bid amount, they did not include a contingency. So I wondered why we would include a contingency when the contractor Sure. Did not. We, we have over the years um, had that line item added into the bidding phase in different, in different forms. Um, sometimes we ask them to include that 5%. Sometimes we take our engineering estimate and we give them a dollar value to add to that. Uh, in this particular instance, we chose to have the, the city add the 5% after the fact only because what we have found is that if you, if you tell a contractor you need to add 532000 
dollars worth of contingency, they can then back calculate exactly what we are estimating the bid to be so that way their bid comes in the same range. And so uh, in either way, the city has the contingency line item in there uh, for those unforeseen or those little things that come up in terms of um, different types of quantity overruns. And, and what that basically means is say that we go to dig in the roadway and everything on our map shows that there's a six inch water line and all of a sudden we dig it up and we find that there's an eight inch water line instead of a six inch water line, the eight inch water line costs more. And so this contingency allows us to be able under our normal purchasing policies to actually pay for those unforeseens or those small overruns and things like that is what that does. So um, the cost overruns wouldn't necessarily be something that the contractor failed to include in their bid. It would be something that was unexpected, not we didn't know, Correct. they didn't know. Correct, that would, be, that would be exactly it. Uh, a very common thing that when we get into these aged areas too is that we find that services are in places we had no idea they were. So where we thought maybe the service was on an alleyway, we find it's in the middle of the roadway, so we have to add, then add a service in. That's another very common thing. And this gives us a mechanism to do that without having to come back to council for every $100 or every $200. And so it would follow the normal purchasing guidelines so that the director could actually approve something up to $25,000. Uh, Mr. Valenzuela could approve up to the $50,000. Anything above that would still go to council for approval, but the funds have been earmarked to be able to handle those kind of things. All right. So, and there is something, Lance, in our um, contract about well, there was nothing in the bid about the contingency fee, but we would put something in the contract about that, that in order for that contingency fee to be applied, it would have to be something that we didn't realize, like the six versus eight inch water line that you mentioned. Sure, what we would typically do is if it is a line item that has already been bid, um, the, the state purchasing regulations allow us to do a certain percentage of overruns or underruns meaning you have a little bit more of a quantity, but there's already a bid line item. Uh, in the event when we find something that was just totally unknown, that we had no idea of, that was not bid on as a line item, then it would actually come through as a change order, which would actually have to have a more official approval. And those dollars are held by the city, they're not held by the contractor, so they can't spend any of those dollars Correct. unless it gets approved through the channels on this end. The contingency dollars. Yes, ma'am. And so the real bid was $2,157,451, and then we've added the contingency on top of that. Yes, that is correct. Does this um, bid also include bearing all of the utilities? This part of it is going to actually uh, primarily be focused on the water and sewer infrastructure. And then we have a line item to install conduit that would allow um, some of the other entities to then relocate their aerial stuff underground. And then when we get to the portion of it where we're doing the roadway construction, the city will be taking our own power lines for the lights, and that part would go underground as well. Billy, do you have additional questions? No, that's it. Thank you so much, uh, Lance. And I make a motion to approve item K. Billy has made a motion to approve item K. Do I have a second? A second. A second by Lane. Any public comment? With no public comment, we'll take a vote. All in favor, say aye. Aye. With none opposed, motion passes 7-0. We will go to item N, which is consider a resolution approving the donation of unused animal services assets to Concho Valley Paws. Morgan, you're on. Morning, Mayor and Council. What I have before you today are a number of items that um, the city of San Angelo no longer uses uh, that were purchased with donated funds. Uh, there is still a need for them to be in place uh, for the Pets Alive uh, partnership, uh, but they're not being used by city staff and to prevent them from simply deteriorating and um, going into a place where they're no longer useful, we'd instead like to assign them to Concha Valley Paws, uh, who can put them into use immediately, uh, take those useful assets, and continue to um, provide that service to the community uh, simply by reassigning ownership. Uh, the items in question are first our adoption trailer. Um, since we assigned um, adoptions to be overseen by Concha Valley Paws in our uh, contract, 
they we haul it occasionally for their adoption events, but they certainly could haul it more if they had authority to um, access it themselves. There's also um, a monthly maintenance that we're required to submit and all repairs the city is still responsible for. So we'd like to instead strike all of that off to Contra Valley Paws to have that freedom uh, to use it as needed. Uh, the second item is related to surgery equipment. Uh, we purchased in 2016 with donated funds uh, a, a bunch of secure, uh, equipment to outfit a surgery suite. Uh, we um, had different incarnations of that. First, the city had their own veterinarian. Uh, then the city contracted with PAUSE for them to subcontract with a veterinarian. Um, and really, the surgery suite at the animal shelter um, is not really what's set up for an appropriate surgery suite. Um, it's We're at much limited space in our facility and in PAUSE um, new facility, their adoption center that they are constructing right now. They will have an appropriate surgery suite. and we're in the market for some surgery equipment um, that we would like to simply just assign to them to have. Um, it's in, um, some of it is in different levels of repair. Some of it is in great condition. Some of it is a little bit broken, uh, but so it's still functional. And since Contra Valley Paws has partnered with us in some contracts on using that equipment, they're well versed in the uh, different components that are being listed there in their exhibit A. The question I have is twofold. One, very often when the city has unused equipment or equipment they no longer need, they put it out for auction. And I've had people ask me why we are not putting this equipment out for auction for other um, animal services companies to take advantage of and maybe bid and the city would make more money on it. So you want to explain why we made it make a decision to work with PAWS and donate this equipment to them? Yes, thank you for that. That's a great question. And the, the primary reason is because it was purchased with donated funds. So first, local dollars bought this, not tax dollars, but citizens stepping up specifically to fund these items. Um, second, um, they are still useful for the Pets Alive partnership. It's something we wanted to keep within our coalition to continue to serve the community. And so by finding that public purpose in a nonprofit who's <coughs> hungry to take on that service, we can still keep these local. Almost certainly, if we put them up for auction, they would be uh, sold off uh, piecemeal, not as one lot, um, and they would go to parts unknown. Uh, the amount of, uh, I, I haven't price these specific items because, as I mentioned, they're in a variety of uh, repair status, um, but the amount that we would make in an auction, um, I think, is, is n nominal compared to the service we can continue to provide um, our citizenry locally for years to come. Thank you for that information. Do I have other, anyone else have questions for Morgan? Yes, Lane, please. Does the equipment revert back to us if the contract ceases? The adoption contract? No, it's not tied to that. So uh, this would be um, donated to Contra Valley Paws. They would sign a, a, a very slick sheet contract that says they're accepting it as um, um, as is, and uh, the current contract we have with them is for, um, it's, it's a five-year contract, like a one-year contract with four years to renew. We're in year two of it right now. We are looking at um, changing the scope of services slightly, which would require a new contract, which I foresee would also be like a medium-length contract like that for five years. Um, so it's not in any way tied to the life of the adoption contract, uh, because we see the value in it being with Concho Valley Paws uh, long-term regardless. Any further questions? I move Lane. Approval, uh, Tommy makes a move for approval. Is there a second? Second. Second by Lucy. Any public comment? With no public comment, we'll take a vote. All in favor, say aye. Aye. With none opposed, motion passes 7 0. Thank you, Morgan. Thank you all. We will move to item R. Consider a resolution creating designated truck routes pursuant to section 1. 0.01.019A2 of the San Angelo Code of Ordinances to allow the inclusion of the newly constructed West 33rd Street and a portion of Riverside Golf Club Road. Thank you, Patrick. You're on. Good morning, Mayor and Council. Um, back in March of this year, uh, Council adopted an ordinance designating uh, truck routes for commercial vehicles over a certain uh, size and weight um, in which those particular vehicles are restricted to certain roadways within the city limits of, of San Angelo. 
Um, what the item before you today does is it modifies the map that's kept on file by the planning department and is published on our website to allow a small portion of Golf Club Road to allow truck traffic, uh, those type of vehicles, to access a property that's developing adjacent to that roadway. So um, yeah, I'm happy to answer any questions you may have about it. Um, Harry, you pulled it. Would you like to ask a question? I really don't have a problem with this, but what I wanted to do was tie this in. I don't know who is responsible for making sure that this ordinance is, um, uh, is works, enforced. works enforced, thank you. Uh, but I see 18 wheelers going down South Chadburn all the time. Uh, and I, you know, I'm sure that that's not a truck route. I, and I just wanted to make sure that we as a council had that conversation with whoever's responsible for making sure that that happens. And get some clarification again on those truck routes because I'm not sure that it, uh, businesses and truck drivers really know where they are. So uh, I think what you're doing here is, is, is correct. I just wanted to have that conversation about um, the enforcement of um, truck routes. Well, the so. enforcement is either by the police or by somebody making a phone call. So there's not someone who's day in and day out out there to enforce it, correct? That is correct. It, it is BD that enforces those, uh, this ordinance. So um, it would be on, on the police department to, uh, <coughs> to ensure that trucks are uh, on designated routes unless they're in a portion of the exclusions that allow deliveries and, and some of those items. See some of these sand trucks actually come down 19th Street, turn on, on Chadburn, and then they come all the way down to either Avenue L or pick up the Luke off of Cristobal Road. Uh, there's got to be better ways to do that. So uh, with that, I'll move to approve this particular I item. have some Just questions. a minute. We have more questions from Council. Billy. Okay. Um, in fact, I was going to pull item R, um, and Harry did it, but I have some questions. Um, Patrick, in some of the background material I was reading, it talked about the southernmost curb off of that um, golf Side golf road. So, um, to me, the southernmost curb would be on 29th Street. But as I understand, the southernmost curb is somewhere else. So that is that is correct. It's actually the southernmost curb cut for the developed property. Um, this this play here is two of the pictures that you had in your background. Um, one being the site plan and one just being the aerial of the, of the property as it currently exists. Um, change that just a little bit and kind of basically overlay that site plan onto the aerial. Um, you can see this, the red line right there, that would be the extent of the designated truck route. So trucks would not be allowed to progress any further south than that particular uh, line right there. And you can see, you know, right there is a um, a curb cut, that curb cut that's being referenced oh, okay. into that property. Okay. So now, is that the Mueller building that I'm looking at there? Yes, ma'am, with the orange rooftop. Mm -hmm. Okay, and absolutely, I have no problem with the truck stop going there. To me, right off the Bryant Thruway, North Bryant Thruway, you know, um, is not a problem. But as I look at this outline in red here, it looks like there's something that is going across the Bryant Thruway up there near 33rd. So what is that? This this portion right here. Well, sorry. No, the no, portion going no further north, north. The you know the, the top of the line right there. The the extent that line right there. Um, that is the portion of Golf Club Road that will be that's being added to the designated truck route. So uh, Bryant Freeway is already on the truck route. We're just extending from that portion of Golf Club Road um, to that, that southern boundary line that we talked about earlier. Okay, I guess what I'm talking about, I'm not understanding. It looks like your red line is going across Bryant Thruway to those apartments to the east, that apartment complex. What is that about? Are, we, are you talking about the square and the circle? Uh -uh. Oh. Very top where, I mean, um, it, if you would say northern end. So the northern end where you have the red line that goes 
starts on the left and goes clear across the freeway over to the housing. Patrick, it's the line from your text box. Over. It's just yeah. a, it's a designation arrow um, from this text box here. Um, are we talking about that line? Is that the line, the arrow that you're referencing? Uh, that, so it's just a designation line. It's it doesn't go beyond the Bryan Thruway. No, ma'am. Okay. No, ma'am. All right. Okay, and so now point out on your sketch over here, what is the exit? I can see the entrance. What is the exit, Patrick, for the truckers when they leave the, the truck stop? It looks like there's a number of, of entrances uh, proposed within this development. They're onto Bryant, there's an exit there, um, another exit, and then 33rd Street is going to be um, developed by the property owner right there, an extension of West 33rd. Um, so truck traffic can either come in from the north moving south into the property mm -hmm. and then exit if they're continuing south on 87, they can exit one of those three locations on 87, or if they're gonna continue north on 87, they can exit onto Golf Club Road, come up to 33rd Street where a new signalized intersection will be and then access 87 to the north. Okay, now, um I'm noticing a new traffic signal, and if I read the material correctly, the developer, the owner of this truck stop will pay for the installation of the traffic signal. Yes, ma'am. A traffic study was performed, and it did meet the criteria um, the, with the anticipated traffic patterns um, for this development to install a signal. The developer will pay for all installation of that. Um, and the city will take on the maintenance, the ongoing maintenance of that signal after, after it's installed, it, inspected, and, and uh, accepted by the city. Okay, um, I think one final question. The um, road, the golf course road, or golf club road, is the developer going to widen that road? I drove that yesterday, and that it's quite a bit of traffic, and I was surprised I didn't realize so much traffic still used that since the golf course was closed. So they're going to widen that road? They will widen that. They will reconstruct the portion of the roadway adjacent to their property mm -hmm. to a minor collector status. So the specifications meet in a minor collector 40 foot wide, as well as the 33rd, uh, the extension of 33rd Street will be a minor collector uh, specification as well. Um, now we have some uh, ball fields, baseball, softball, little league fields out there. The truck traffic will not extend down to where those baseball fields start, right? No, ma'am. No, okay. ma'am. The and that there will be signage placed at the at the extent of that that route in order to inform trucks that basically say commercial vehicles over 33,000 GBW prohibited, and then we'll have the ordinance cited underneath that sign, um, and that will give them notification that they cannot proceed any further south down Golden Club or Golf Club Road. Um, so no, no trucks will be able to pass through that area to 29th Street. Thank you, Patrick. I believe that's all my questions. Uh, uh, would you make a motion then, Billy? If no, does anyone else have any questions? Harry made a motion. Harry, well, he made a motion before she asked questions, so we have to have a new motion on the floor. You want to make a motion? Motion to approve this item is presented. Seconded Second by Lucy. Um, any public comment? No public comment. We'll take a vote. All in favor say aye. 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 Motion passes 7 Thank you. 0. With item R having been approved, it will um, conclude conversation about the consent agenda. So we will move into the regular agenda. Comments regarding items on the regular agenda may be made by the public when each item is discussed as outlined above. Applicants, proponents, and appellants are expected from the time limit above and instead must limit their remarks to less than five minutes. We will start with item A, which is the first reading and public hearing of an ordinance approving the abandonment of approximately 8,800 square feet of the East Avenue D public right-of-way generally located west of South Chabern Street, south of West Avenue C, and north of West Washington Drive. John, you're on. Thank you, John James, Director of Planning and Development Services. Uh, this is, although it's called Avenue D, this is a portion 
of that road that was platted in the past but never constructed. Uh, as you can see from this photo, um, it is currently a parking lot and it is used for the depot. Uh, and if you, it's a little hard to see, but there's a train that sits partly across that right of way. And basically, this is just cleaning up the property to remove it as public right of way, uh, but it will be retained as uh, publicly usable land. It won't, in other words, it won't go to the adjacent property owners. Uh, it will be retained by the city. Uh, here's a little bit closer look at, at that. pictures of the area uh, as well. Uh, we did send out our notifications, did not receive any uh, in favor or in opposition. Uh, we did send this around to all relevant departments as well as public utilities. Um, and uh, as part of this, we made a finding that there is no public benefit to keeping it open as a right of way. It's never been used as a street and given the layout, we never anticipate it being used as a street. Staff does recommend approval. Um, it will require a uh, replat of the property to incorporate this into the adjacent properties uh, and possibly shifting some of the property lines a little bit uh, in relationship to the uh, depot. Uh, this did go to the Planning Commission at their November meeting and they all, uh, unanimously recommended approval. With that, I'd be happy to answer any questions. So the city owns it now? Yes, it's public right of way, so in the city, is the custodian of the of that so it's it's a little bit different than purely owned property uh, and so this will transfer it out of public right-of-way into uh, basically owned property so when it comes out of public right-of-way what does that mean to the public well it won't necessarily be accessible to the public like a public street is is open to the public and usable by anyone in the public uh, shifting it to effectively private ownership, although it's still owned by the city, uh, then it becomes a, a, separate, a separate property that is not public right-of-way. And so no streets could ever be built there in the future, um, as was originally platted. And is there going to be any confusion on the public's perspective, considering it has, has been a public right-of-way? No, again, a street has never been constructed there and it's never been used as a public right-of-way. It was just platted that way back in uh, okay. either the late 1800s, early 1900s when it was platted. Do I have further questions from council for John? With no further questions, do I have a motion? Motion to approve. Second. And a second by um, Harry. Any public comment? With no public comment, we'll take a vote. All in favor of approving item A, say aye. 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 With none opposed, motion passes 7-0. Item B is the first reading and public hearing of an ordinance requesting to abandon the 20 feet by 350 feet east-west alley in Block 49, Fairview Edition between North Cecil Street and North Archer Street and East Houston Heart Expressway and Vex Street. John? Thank you. This is, um, uh, you can see the block here. Uh, there is an alley. Uh, you can see that it was platted in the middle of this block. Again, it's an alley that has not been constructed. Uh, as you can see, this, most of the block is owned by Republic Services, and they're the requester in this case. Uh, and as you can see, they've, they have fenced the entirety of this property, and they use what is a platted alley for storage as if it's part of their lot. And so they just wanted to clean up the situation to formally incorporate it into their lot. Uh, there are two property owners here, um, and uh, they would have the option to take in their half of that alley if they so choose. Uh, if they choose not to do that, then Republic has said they would take it into their uh, replat. Uh, so e in any case, we would, uh, the, the entire alley would be abandoned. Uh, this is an industrial, uh, the, the long range plan calls for industrial and the zoning of the area is heavy manufacturing. Uh, you can see here the alley runs right through there, uh, but for some time that's been effectively incorporated into the adjacent property. Uh, this is looking from the other direction, the two uh, property owners uh, and so the alley is is through this way. Um, you can see that at some point that's been used as a, kind of a driveway. Uh, but my understanding is that those adjacent property owners are not opposed, uh, although they may be here to speak. Uh, 
This is just a description of what I already explained of the, the three different property owners that would be affected by this. Uh, staff does recommend approval with three conditions. The Planning Commission also recommended unanimous approval with those same three conditions. Um, there's currently no use of the alley that, uh, that we can tell. Uh, that access you saw it can be used to access an electric pole, uh, but like we normally contact all the utilities uh, and those utilities will be maintained either in easements or they'll be moved if necessary. The uh, conditions recommended uh, as part of the approval, uh, payment of the assessment fee, that's by ordinance, uh, any abandonment, the adjacent property owners uh, pay the fee to acquire their share. Uh, so if those two uh, private property owners other than Republic want to take in their half of the alley, they'll pay a, a, a fee uh, and it's based on the uh, value of the surrounding properties. Uh, we'll also have to record a quick claim deed, basically giving up the city's rights to the property. Uh, and then the adjacent properties will have to replat that what was the alley into their properties. With that, I'll be happy to answer any questions. Do I have questions from council? If no questions from council. Do I have a motion for approval? So move. Second. A motion by Harry, a second by Lucy. Any public comment? With no public comment, we'll take a vote. All in favor, say aye. 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 None opposed. Motion passes 7-0. Item C. Annexation public comment hearing and consideration on a request by petition of the property owner for annexation of an 8.401 acre tract generally described as an area of land out of Casper Berber, Berberich survey 177 abstract number 52 and also being out of a 25.361 acre tract described and recorded in instrument number 20166044 official public records of Tom Green County, Texas. One, first public hearing on possible annexation, and two, first public, first reading and public hearing of an ordinance annexing into the city of San Angelo the property referenced above and authorizing the city manager to negotiate and execute all related documents. Number one, I thought we did this on the last city council meeting. Uh, no, in fact, at the last city council meeting, um, you accepted the petition for annexation, so all you did at that point was say that to the applicant, you will accept the petition uh, and consider the annexation. That started the process whereby the staff went through steps leading to today. Uh, and the main reason for that uh, under state law is if somebody requests annexation of a piece of property that you absolutely know you're never going to accept, then it saves you and staff the time of going through the, the subsequent steps if you just say, no, we're not even going to accept the petition. So at the last, the last time you all saw this, you simply accepted their petition to start the process. Okay. So do I have questions from council? No questions from council. Do I have a motion for approval? So moved. Moved by Billy, seconded by Harry. Any public comment? And I will say, you, because of the quirks in state law, you have to hold two public hearings. Uh, and so you'll have to open the public hearing, close that public hearing, and then consider the ordinance, and, and then a second public hearing on the ordinance, if that makes sense. All today? Yes. Why not in January for the second public hearing? Well, this will come back on second reading, but the uh, state law requires a public hearing before you consider the ordinance. If this were a more complicated annexation, normally that public hearing is at a separate meeting, but the state law allows for a simple annexation on the request of the property owner. It allows both public hearings to be at the same meeting. Okay, so we have a motion and a second with no public comment. We are going to take a vote on this, and then I'm going to take another motion, another second. It doesn't no. require two votes. It just okay. requires, it requires a public hearing before you vote on the ordinance. Uh, and then another public hearing on the ordinance, and then you vote. So, Mayor, if you could just ask for any comments on the possible annexation, and then if there are none, then ask for comments on the actual ordinance. Well, I already asked for public comment on it once. On which one of those two? I did on the whole C1 and 2. I asked okay. for public comment because I had a motion and a second on the floor, so I asked for public comment. There was none. So, um then ask for public comment on the actual ordinance that was presented. Because so, you do have to address them separately. 
So I'm asking for public comment on the actual ordinance. And there is none. And so with that, we take the vote. And we are taking the vote now. Okay. Or maybe we're not. <laughs> <laughs> we could consider it again. With that, all in favor say aye. 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 None opposed. For first and second reading, approved. That was just first reading. It'll come back on second reading, but that will likely be on the consent agenda at the next meeting. All right, we got her done. <laughs> we think. More than two yeah. steps at a time. That gets a little confusing. Yeah. After that. Okay, we'll move into item D. Consider an appeal of the Planning Commission's decision to approve partial variances from Chapter 10.111.8.2 of the Land Development and Subdivision Ordinance in the first replat in Block 11, Lakeview addition to allow East 48th Street and East 49th Street to pave their incremental half and no curb and gutter in lieu of the required 40-foot width with curb and gutter based on the width of these streets west of Bowie Street with an option to defer these required improvements through a developer agreement. And John, you're on. Thank you. I know that was a mouthful and it'll become sure hopefully is. more clear as um, as I describe what um, the Planning Commission approved. And uh, just, as a, uh, just so you know, at the very end, I will give you the options that you have available uh, because there are multiple options here to overrule the Planning Commission or approve what they did or uh, you know, deny it altogether. Uh, this is the area. You can see Lakeview Heroes Drive is right up here. Uh, this is Bowie Street. And so you, in red there, you can see the subject properties. This is the proposed plat. Uh, it takes what were three lots and three lots to the south as well that faced, uh, all the lots faced 48th and 49th streets. And so what they did was reorient those lots to face Bowie Street here. Uh, and that, that was approved? Uh, the plat was approved with the partial variances that I'll describe. And so what comes before you today is an appeal of those partial variances. Uh, the applicant on this plat is asking for a full waiver uh, of those street improvements rather than the partial waiver that the Planning Commission uh, approved. Uh, just some pictures in the area. This, these uh, are, are Bowie Street. Uh, as part of the approval of the Planning Commission, they authorized Bowie Street to remain at its current width. Uh, normally, if you're replatting property adjacent to a street, like Bowie that's substandard, the, the ordinance triggers widening that street to our current city standard. But in a situation like this where the street already exists, uh, it's not uncommon for the Planning Commission to waive widening that street, uh, but allowing it to remain at that current width. So uh, here's a list of all the things the Commission approved. I just wanted to, this to give you some context, but all you're being asked today to look at is the one, or actually the two variances regarding 48th and 49th Street. Uh, but they did approve the plat. As I mentioned, they granted the variance for Bowie Street to remain at its current width of 30 feet and also with no curb and gutter uh, instead of the 40 feet that would normally be required and curb and gutter on the street. Uh, they did remove a requirement to extend water and sewer prior to plat recordation. Um, the, again, this isn't before you today, but there are some utility ordinances that still might require or will require that uh, water and sewer extension, uh, but that's, that's not before you. Um, they also approved some alley variances for the width of alleys, and uh, a requirement to pave those alleys was waived. Yes, yes, Billy. Before he moves on from that slide, may I ask a question? Yes, so ma'am. Um, on the third bullet, John, when it says removed requirement to extend water sewer, um, there are no water sewer access to those properties now? Those properties have access to water and sewer from Bowie Street, but normally uh, when you replat a property, uh, so there's, there's water and sewer along Bowie, uh, but when you replat a property, they would need to extend water and sewer either down the alley uh, or along the street rights of way. That way, um, properties back here that are currently undeveloped then also have access to extend those water and sewer lines even farther. Uh, so the normal requirement is to extend water and sewer to the edge of your property, even if it's already served uh, 
by other water lines. And so what the Planning Commission did was say uh, they don't have to extend those water and sewer lines in order to record the plat. Um, but they would have to extend those before they could develop the property, right? Yes. Okay, thank you. And these are looking east on, this is from the development, so, so 48th and 49th Street in the development do not exist today, but if you look the other direction, you can see 48th and 49th, uh, and that's relevant because uh, the Planning Commission's decision was that the extension of 48th and 49th into this property only has to be the width of these streets here, which is 24 to 26 feet wide instead of, again, instead of the normal 40-foot street that a, a brand new street under the subdivision regulations would normally be required. Weren't we re-looking at street widths and new subdivisions as, as something narrower than the original 40 feet? Because that's been talked about for a long time. Uh, yes. And yes. so really what we're doing is allow them to do what we're going to do down the road anyway. Well, sort of. It, sort none of? of? None of the recommendations that staff has made uh, in any case, would ever allow a street narrower than than 30 feet for a standard street. Uh, in some cases, we can allow down to 26 uh, because that's the minimum allowed uh, or that we would require for fire uh, access. Uh, but uh, e even under the proposed ordinance that hasn't yet come through the process, 30 feet would be the, the minimum width of any brand newly constructed street. And so then the, the, I mentioned those other variances and approvals the Planning Commission did. Uh, this is actually the approval that uh, is coming to you on appeal. They approved a partial variance to obligate the developer to construct only half of the street at the width of 48th and 49th, one block over. So in other words, uh, the total street width would only have to be 26 feet, and this developer would only be responsible for their half, which would be 13 feet of the street. But critically here, they also deferred that construction until future development occurs because nobody wants a 13-foot wide street out there. Uh, so basically, the developer would still be obligated to construct their half of the street, but they wouldn't actually have to pull the trigger on that until other development occurs, triggering construction of the other half of the street. So question here. So let me just paint a scenario. So let's say... Um, there's no construction on this because there hasn't been development. So 50 years down the road, they still haven't developed that. And hopefully the developer will still be alive in 50 years. But let's say the developer is not alive in 50 years. So then who takes up that responsibility? I mean, we're setting ourselves up for a scenario down the road. But who's going to point fingers at who? Well, and the way that normally works is uh, there's sort of a joint responsibility. Uh, and so the developer would have that responsibility, um, but the <coughs> obligation would also be filed in the county deed <coughs> records. Uh, so if the if the uh, developer is uh, out of business or gone or, uh, you know, it's 50 years in the future, uh, these properties would maintain that obligation. And so... The property owners would? Yes. Uh, it's sort of like a what you, we used to do as special assessments. Um, and so... Uh, and the, the, the way we look at it is if that street was constructed today, that cost would be passed on to those homeowners as part of their lot cost and, and overall home cost. And so, so we would have a real estate contract written that says if the developer dies in the next 25 years, you, the property owner, even though you might have sold it three times over that 25 years, you will be obligated to pay for that 13 feet width of payment for 150 feet. I mean, this that, is really setting a standard that I think is pretty hard to, if you think through this step by step, we're setting up something that doesn't make any sense at all for down the road. So if you Lane, that please. property and you sold it to me and I sold it to, <coughs> to Billy and, and Billy then, sold it to Lucy, who's responsible? It's my Lucy, point. Lucy would be the the, the ultimate the person, property. but who's going to buy it with that obligation on the fourth go around on the 24th 24th year and that would have to be in the real estate contract oh it would be in the deed record so it would be one yes, of the things that the would show up in the I title know. search yes that's correct um, and if, if you recall we only recently changed the ordinance to allow such a deferral agreement uh, and that was one of the concerns there's pros and cons to doing it that way uh, the benefit is 
uh, you can maintain an obligation that is there under the ordinance for a, for a developer of a property, but not require them to do it today. Uh, yes, it, the, the negative is it shifts it to someone in the future, but the positive is it doesn't then fall to city taxpayers to construct that uh, at some point in the future. Is that on all six of these properties? Or just the uh, yes, so basically these, it, whatever, at whatever point that was triggered, the construction of 49th, these three properties would equally share a third of the cost of that, and then the same with 48th on the other three properties. So, John? Here, yeah, Tommy, would you like to ask a question? Thanks. Well, we've, you've got that property behind there. Um, is there any interest? Have, have you all had any indication that there might be any interest in that property that are behind these six there? Well, to the northern part, isn't that a big empty lot with a big hole in it where it has been dug up and the land that was in, there's a big hole there that was used to construct late, um, the Lakeview Heroes Drive. So it would cost somebody an arm and a leg to pr get that land prepared for future development. That's not going to happen. We have recently been contacted by potential buyers of property back here as well as some property here. Um, so in that case, if this were adopted, um, that th 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 the agreement was deferred, um, whose responsibility does it become then, the current developer of these six homes, or does that become the responsibility of the developer of that property, if it's not the same developer, of that other developer behind those six, whose responsibility or is there any responsibility for streets at that point? Well, let me, I'll give you two different scenarios. Let's just say that these properties, somebody bought those and came in tomorrow to develop them. If you waive the obligation on this developer, then in order to get the streets back to this development, this developer would be responsible for the full width of the street on the section we're talking about, as well as to the properties that they would be developing. Uh, if, on the other hand, you maintain the obligation on this developer, then they would be responsible for their half, and then this developer would be responsible for the portion they're already responsible for, as well as finishing the other 13 feet on the other side. Uh, similarly, if these properties developed, they would be responsible for their half. If you waive the obligation on these developers, then that developer would also be responsible for the other half. So. Um, and I think I've got a slide on that, but basically you're, um, if you waive the obligation on this developer, you're shifting that cost either to future developers of these other properties uh, or potentially to city taxpayers to fill in the gap uh, if that's necessary at some point in the future. We've got enough, uh, we've all encountered in our own districts uh, things that have been not followed correctly so that then we're shifting the burden to the taxpayers and I'm not in favor of doing that, um, of shifting it to the taxpayers. Um, so uh, thanks for clearing that up on, on what, ha what would happen uh, if somebody were interested in that property back there. there. Yes, Billy. Um, John, if we are talking about this and there was a recommendation to defer on the current developers to defer doing anything with the street. If we change that, wouldn't that address what the mayor was saying? If we required them to be respond, the developer to be responsible for their 13 feet of the street now rather than deferring it, then we wouldn't have to worry about that developer dying or going out of business or anything. That would be a solution to, to that because I'm like Tommy. I do not want to foster onto taxpayers at some future point the responsibility of doing something sh that should have been done by the developer when they develop these properties. So, um, but that is that one of the options we would have to to undo the it, deferral it is, thing. Let me answer that a couple of ways. One, the 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 ordinance obligation for the developer is for 26 feet. Of, of pavement. Uh, and that's because we don't allow a street to be constructed any less than 26 feet. 
Uh, and so the Planning Commission, by, off, by uh, giving a partial variance, has already reduced that obligation from 26 feet to 13. Um, and so we would not want to see a street constructed at only 13 feet width. Uh, so um, we, I think our recommendation is either defer that, where their obligation is only 13 feet, but we, we delay that until the rest of the road is developed, or alternatively obligate them to do what the ordinance says today is do the full 26 feet uh, just for that 150 feet back uh, so that we have a full usable road. So John, uh, you know, just ballpark figure, what is the cost of developing the 26 foot road? I'm going to defer that to Lance because I know engineering has looked at that. And so we could either have him come up now or, or Let's have you come up now because okay. I think it's an important part to understand you can't have affordable housing. And that's what this part of San Angelo Lakeview is about is affordable housing. And at some point you can't make affordable housing happen if you have to eat 60000 to $120,000 of additional road expense. So what we are seeing is that a 26-foot roadway with, uh, with no curb or gutter um, is roughly going to be about $39,000 for 150 feet. And so that price would be both for 48th and 49th. Combined or each? What did each. you say? That, that, that would be each. $78,000. And then his incremental half, if he were only doing the 13 feet, is 19.5 times 2. So essentially it's 39 for one, or if you guys uphold the 13 feet, it's 39 for the, the both together. So 40,000 basically divided by six yes, has to be added into the cost of the house. So all of a sudden the house can't sell for 150 or 160,000, but now it's got to go up to $170,000. And so you take that house out of the market for that area. Well, not necessarily, Mayor. When we look at um, our housing situation where we have very limited housing now, you know, Houses are being sold. We have a 96%, I think you told us at a previous meeting, apartment occupancy rate. And um, what I've heard from several people that I've rented to is that um, people are buying homes in San Angelo who work in the oil field and they're commuting back and forth. So I don't know how much you would have to add to each homeowner's price for their home to construct the street, but I think we have to look at the fairness of all of it. Is it fair for taxpayers who don't even live in Lakeview to have to pick up the cost for some future development of the street? I, I just don't think so. Well, It'll be the tax base generated from the development. Correct. If you have zero houses developed, you get no tax base. And so you have to start taking a look at, at what you're going to generate by additional property taxes on those properties, because that is, and generally speaking, if you look at it in certain areas of the city, there is a price range of which people are willing to pay. And you can't expect someone to pay more than they can afford. And the housing study that was done and came out, number one issue they talked about was the amount of people who felt like buying houses in San Angelo was out of the realm of their world because the average house price was so unaffordable for them. And so what you're really trying to do is to get more people into affordable housing, but affordable housing stops at a certain price point. And in certain markets, there's a price range of which the customer is willing to pay for in that area of town. So any additional expense to the cost of building that house, if it is roads, if it's water and it's sewer, have to be put into the cost of the home. The builders are not going to build houses and, and go into a, a red situation. Each house, even if it is, makes very little money, they can't, make, can't build houses and sell them for less than it costs to build them. And to, the actual cost of the home has to include streets, water, sewer, et cetera. It's all combined in there. You add another $40,000 to six properties, that's going to be added on to the price of the home. Bottom line, just is. And Mayor, I certainly don't disagree with what you're saying, but 
What about the other developers that are going to come in and they're going to have to bear the cost not for just 150 feet, they're going to have to bear the cost for 300 feet or whatever the entire length of that. So why should whoever is developing these now get off scot-free and future developers have to pay the whole boatload? So the, the question mark is how long is it going to take that area to develop? So if you're looking, and I bring it up before, 30 years before the rest of that's developed, what do you do? Well, I got, I got I a question for the council. Yes, I got Tommy. A I'm, I'm going to shift gears here a little bit. If we want to encourage infill, which I th I, I, my sense is the council in, in our past actions has wanted to encourage infill, how about we maybe participate with some of these developers in encouraging infill and maybe we direct staff to say something like this folks it would be a narrow definition well, I'm, I'm pulling this off the top of my head but it'd be a narrow definition in these infill areas of what would qualify for encouragement by the city participation by the city um, we've got $200,000 we set aside um, for infill help. And maybe we start using some of that money to participate in something like this with the developer. Now, I'm, the developer's not going to get out of this without nothing in it, but we help participate in that effort to see if we can't then kickstart some development. <clears throat> even in other areas that might also qualify. Maybe it's the target neighborhoods, the CBDG target neighborhoods, where this would be a participating thing. So there's, a, there's, a, there's some food for thought. Daniel, do you have any? Actually, um, the, you, you bring a really good point here because I know we did do the, uh, the $200,000 that we do set aside for the NFL program. I do understand this project specifically because it's such a small project. It's six lots. Uh, so really, when you start looking at economies of scale, if you were to do a whole big old section and you're doing, you're doing the roads, actually the cost goes down when you're doing that. But if you're, if you're doing uh, six lots, the costs are more pro prohibitive, really. So what you're saying right now, Tommy, makes a lot of sense, uh, especially in an area that, quite frankly, I think the, uh, the plats the, uh, in this area uh, this, this year was planted back in 1908, so there hasn't been any development whatsoever since 1908 here in this one section. So, Tommy, what you're saying does make sense. I mean, we could take a look at it from the perspective of, is this a project that would qualify under the uh, targeted neighborhoods for neighborhood revitalization? And we do have those six neighborhoods that we could actually qualify for that. And we could, we could call it a, a catalyst-type project to encourage a development in that area. And if that's the case, uh, there is a benefit absolutely to the city in doing that because once it starts developing, hopefully we'll start seeing the future development in other areas as well. So um, on our end, we can definitely develop a plan for our <coughs> staff to dis uh, discuss how we can actually do that. But that definitely is a possibility. You know, I want everybody to keep in mind that this, this area of town, um, you, as you mentioned, 1908, I mean, we haven't had new development in this area of town since 1908. Do we want new development? Do we want affordable housing? Do we want to take care of the needs that have come out very clearly in the housing study that says affordable housing is a crisis issue in San Angelo? Not for oil field workers, but for people who've lived here, born and raised here, and they feel like the market is out dollared their ability, and they want to be in a house, and they want to live in this area, but can't afford to, and don't have any choices because there hasn't been any new development. And the other part that is significant in this is that when you have new development like this happening, what happens is neighbors around you all of a sudden want to improve their house and improve their neighborhood. It brings a very positive very positive state of mind to the people in that neighborhood. It's been ignored forever and ever and ever. They haven't seen new development. They have felt like there has been no one who cares about what goes on in that part of town. New development has brought life and energy and positiveness to this part of San Angelo. And I am determined that we have the ability to satisfy the need for affordable housing. It's 
It is a very important part of quality of life in San Angelo. And I believe quality of life should exist for all citizens at all levels of income. And this is hugely important to me. And I say the following, if this, de if this development didn't start to happen, no one would even be interested in any other parts of this area. In the past 18 months, there's been more new development in this part of San Angelo than there has been since 1908. John, question for you: If 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 we if if council were to direct staff to to come up with something that that would um, help be a catalyst in in certain areas, the six areas as Daniel mentioned, what would need to happen today on this? Um, since we, we, we have we have the item before us, so that we're fair to the the, the proponents of of this project. But if there was going to be some participation at some level by the city, what would be the appropriate action um, today? You know, I guess that that's hard to say without a program in place to uh, identify what you would actually be approving. Uh, you know, the, the short answer is today you have to decide on whether or not to obligate them to do something. If if your decision is to obligate them for some portion of the street, 26 feet, 13, whatever, then you could come back and, and uh, authorize some assistance at a later date. Um, of course, from their perspective, they walk away today not knowing uh, what that's going to be. can't delay the project. Time is money. And as as was mentioned, the the target areas, as you know, you already did authorize uh, some funding, the five thousand dollars per lot in those target areas, which this is is one. Uh, so this developer will be getting or is eligible for five thousand dollars per lot uh, for that assistance. But, but, the, but I think, it is a combination of can be roads and can be water and sewer. Correct. And, and if you have to extend water and sewer and roads, $5,000 per unit does not even begin to make a dent. That's right. Based on the numbers Lance gave you, that, it, that does, clearly does not hole. cover the whole cost. Exactly. You're in the hole. Brenda, yes, sir, I'm Tom. Um, I see every side here, and I agree with everyone. There's no argument, and nobody here has been incorrect in their statements. But from the north side of town in North Chadburn, and specifically this district, it's been a long time coming seeing some development. It's been encouraging to see new homes that people pass and drive by every day. I understand new homes in a position on this. A lot of these homes are probably predetermined who the owner's going to be, uh, may have already been contracted, um, the paperwork's done to come back and put some financial additions on this after those certainly changes your margin and, and profitability and project. We all get that. We understand that. But I, I like where Tommy's going. It'd be great if we could come up and target an area that is specifically labeled and designed for some infill and come back with some funds. You know, I, I see building a house, but the, the point is where does the city become responsibility for you know, having a road and an alley and a street versus a developer. And it may not be a developer that gets the rest of that property. So while it's easy to sit here and say, yeah, I can develop this number of homes, I may not get the adjacent property. And so to assume that profit, uh, to assume that cost might be a burden entirely. And the next person also might get out of it completely. Who knows? But, you know, my, my intent here is that this construction needs to happen. I don't know how we get there, but this thing needs to go through. To, to make the construction feasible. And I don't know if, if Tommy's path on finding some other funds to help on the infill is the way to go, but it sure sounds policy right now. The question mark is how, when, and how timeliness of it. But Harry, um, you act like you have a question or comment. I, I would offer this. If you have the opportunity to go to the Lakeview area and see some of the homes that have been built and see what the property owners adjacent to them, to those new homes, have done with their properties. I, I can tell you, I, I agree with Tom, this needs to happen, and we need to find a way that we'll, we'll do that. 
to Brenda's point, we really need to make a decision today on this so we can so the developers can go forward. Uh, but I would also say that I understand Billy's point, and that is, can we expect in each development that the taxpayers are going to be responsible for these roads? I don't think so. But I think Tom said it perfectly. The developer has started on this. Most of these lots are already sold, and people are waiting for the homes to be built. Cannot allow the developer today to take a large hit on these streets because if they do, they're not going to develop the property. I, I can guarantee you, you're not. Somebody that's in business is not in business to lose money, and I can tell you that margin is not very great. So we have to find a way to allow this this developer to go forward with this, and then maybe what we need to do, to Tommy's point, is to look at what we're going to do for future infills because there's need all over the city. Well, and what we, I mean, it goes back once again. I'm going to say this again, 1908. 1908. Do we want to continue to allow this to be vacant land with zero property tax dollars, or would we like to see development that someone can make a dollar on, add property taxes, which we need, and develop an area that helps satisfy the affordable living needs of this city, clearly identified in the housing study, clearly identified. And it was clearly identified at what price point these houses needed to be. It's not a made up number. Get the study. Study the study. This price range is a huge need. No new development since 1908. It's property tax dollars we'll never get if we don't allow these projects to move forward and make some concessions. And I think if you take a look at the combined area and all of the new homes, whether it's by new home or someone else, additional property tax dollars are coming online because all of a sudden this area is being looked at that hasn't been looked at since 1908. Mayor, tell us again yes. how much the homes we're going to be going for. 150 to 160,000. Brenda, with your statement, yes, sir, I'll I will move to accept the appeal. Thank you. A motion on the floor. Is there a second? <coughs> All in. Mayor, if I may yes, ask. Daniel. Mayor, I would like to go back and take a look at the um, the incentive program that we have in place for NFL, and actually take a look at from the perspective of creating criteria that encourages initial investment in there. This is an initial project that should encourage, hopefully, be a catalyst for other development in that area. Well, I do want to make sure that we do, do develop criteria to actually address projects like these and encourage what you're talking about as far as the uh, catalyst projects that will encourage development in the future. We do know that in the future, uh, those areas will have to be addressed as far as those streets. But hopefully, uh, once staff comes together, we can actually come up with a criteria <coughs> that actually qualifies these types of projects. So I'd like to see okay. us um, accept Lane's motion with a second. Uh, and following the, hold on one second, let me finish my statement. And once we allow this to move forward, the city can go back and put together some um, strategic plans financially and, and conceptually that will help address some of these issues, Billy. Yes, I just wanted to say that, um, you know, I think that what Tommy said is a good idea for us to take a look at, and um, certainly we hopefully can do something. I hesitate to, um, well, I'm still concerned that um, as we go down the road that we won't be adversely impacting other developers that we require, and I think we are going to be setting a precedent here. But I agree, we need, San Angelo needs affordable housing. I agree, the point is well taken about 1908. Certainly, uh, we need the development to, you know, to go forward. I want to see it go forward. I'm not opposed to that. But I just think when we look at developing areas, we have to look at who is going to bear the cost, the additional cost of the burden of, because, you know, 
there is a need in the Lakeview area. We're going to run across other areas that don't have adequate streets that are going to have to be developed. And it's going to be whether the city, the entire city, all of the taxpayers in San Angelo bear that cost or do we require it, you know, of the developers. So I can certainly support, since we're already going to be giving $5,000 per lot, a total of 30000 and what Lance said, the cost to, to do this would be 80000 then we as a city can probably kick in a little bit more of what we have set aside to accept the burden of this, but I think we're gonna have to be prepared to accept the burden of this for every developer that wants to go out in that area, and that's all I'm saying. I don't want to be a roadblock to anything that would cause the developers to stop <clears throat> doing this, but I think we have to be realistic about what we're setting ourselves up for. Ellen, you're you're yes, correct. This, I have th this is setting a precedent, because mm -hmm. uh, we're gonna have other developers coming and wanting something similar. So I think well, whatever staff comes up with, Daniel, is going to be critical so that we are, the, so, so that our staff is not overrun thinking that they may qualify for um, some assistance when it's going to be a, a pretty narrow, I would think. Um, Billy, I echo everything you just said. It, this, this bothers me um, that, that this, this precedent is. Uh, Lucy? Yes, I was going to say I totally agree with Billy's comments about the future developers coming in. And what I wanted to ask was, okay, so if we're saying all this about the future, what are actually are we approving today? What we the motion on the floor is as follows: the motion is to uh, support the appeal and um, allow them to go forward without the requirement on the 13 foot wide pavement, and that in conversation, although this is not part of the motion, is is that the city will in fact look at opportunities where there could be some additional funding and different strategic plans put out there to help um, further development. Mayor, and yes, I, do, I do want to point out as well that uh, in doing so, as far as any project that we bring back to the city, as far as the infill and uh, a, a project that actually encourages catalyst programs like this, there's going to have to be a budget that's going to be set aside. And of that budget, with those individuals, those developers that come and meet the criteria, once that budget is, is expended, we can't go beyond that anyway. But it's going to be one of these deals where it's going to be a first come, first serve uh, type of situation when we start looking at that. And so. we also have to remember these additional build outs, homes being built, bring property tax dollars to an area that has had very low property tax contribution to the total city lane. Lance, with that, what was your number for 13 foot uh, stretch on each side total? That, that that number for the 13, 13 foot only was uh, nineteen thousand five hundred dollars. However, if the Each city, side, right? if the Each city, side. So forty thousand. Yes. So it's roughly thirty nine thousand for a twenty six foot road. Uh, I will tell you that if the city were be the one to build that, we would not build a twenty six foot road. We would actually build it correctly to a minimum of thirty foot with the curbs, and so that price would actually climb up a little bit more than that. Um, because 26 foot is technically not a actual standard that we have in any of our documentation. With our tax rate, those six homes in in, um, in one year will bring about $7,450 in tax base, and that would pay off the that's road. That's just in, year one. In, that's just year one. That would pay off the road in five years for both sides, just in generated a tax base without those homes being generated there, we wouldn't get, be getting that. So that well, catalysts it to be able to, be, to pay for that. If you look at it the way that I'm looking at it, my other question is all of the green lines, John, <clears throat> are those platted areas or are those just subject, what we have in our city for just potential addresses? Let me stop for a minute. We have a motion on the floor in a second. And this conversation is going beyond the motion on the floor. Is that okay? Okay. Those are all platted lots. Okay. Um, so that would, the tax base generating for this catalyst project would obviously pay for it in five years 
that 13 foot stretch and wouldn't so, have to be on the burden. Lane, of you're not you saying minute, that you suggest that we burden the developer behind here with the entire street on both 40. You're, that's not what you're suggesting, is it? No, what, I'm, what I'm suggesting is, is if any other development would happen behind that, where all the other platted properties are, um, without, having, without having to develop 13 foot by the length of the property on each side, use the tax base generated by the development of those six properties Pay for the roads that way whenever it comes time to someone developing those properties because the problem that I see here is it's I didn't count how many green boxes there were but there was obviously more than 50 and we have six so that ratio is fit, uh, six to 50 is small at this point right here to not go ahead and pave and infrastructure the entire Block. But right now, as that catalyst is going to do, is to generate someone wanting to develop the rest of that. And with the tax base generated from these six, it would pay for it as we go. Let me also throw out a national statistic, and that is, is that for every thousand dollars you add to the cost of a home, you lose a thousand potential buyers. If you take the $40,000 and divide it by six, you're adding $6,600 to the cost of each home. The cost. And the developer's got to have some margin on that, so you're looking at a substantial change in the price. Every $1,000 you add to the cost of a home, retail price dramatically diminishes the number of people who can afford to pay for it. We have a motion on the floor, a second by Harry, and we've had public discussion. Do I have, or we've had additional questions from council? Do we have public comment? <clears throat> Mayor Steve Hampton, um, of District Six. Excuse me, I meant, didn't mention that before. Uh, are we, uh, let me get this straight. Are we uh, over by uh, the on Travis Street? Uh, by the school, uh, Lincoln Junior High, is that where we're at? It's on Lakeview Hero. Yes. Well, right, right across from uh, Lincoln Junior High, there's a, a very new uh, addition that has, they all have curbs, very nice homes, apparently. And uh, they are, have, why are they held to a higher standard <clears throat> when they develop there, then 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 the rest of the uh, the rest of the uh, the neighborhood, and now we want to reduce it even more. I don't think so. I think uh, what your planning uh, board has uh, recommended is what you need to go with, and uh, they've considered it uh, well. I appreciate what Billy and others have said. Uh, very good. Uh, rebuttal and comments, uh, but uh, I think you're, you're going too far, uh, and uh, we've, they've already been supplemented, and I, don't, I think that's sufficient. Thank you. Thank you very much. Further public comment? I'm my bigger staff. I'm co-owner of New Home Constructors. I'm Chad Decker, uh, also co-owner of New Home Constructors. And I can tell you that five minutes wouldn't be enough for what I have to say, but, but I'm going to do the best I can. Uh, to answer Mrs. DeWitt's and Mr. Hebert's comments, we've already expended hundreds of thousands of dollars expanding your infrastructure. For infill development in Lakeview, the city has not contributed one cent in the cost of that infrastructure. And we built that infrastructure in front of those homes on buoy. And we thought we would take advantage of the opportunity to turn those six lots and build six more homes. The demand is tremendous for, for, for affordable homes in San Angelo, Texas. I've got a document here for each of you to read that summarizes what the housing study presented. Exactly what new home has done. 
They've taken that housing study and we've gone over there and we've invested the money. We keep getting mixed signals of what this city wants. We got turned down by the Planning Commission on a $31 million investment in Lakeview yesterday. Does that tell you how I feel? I'm, spilling, I'm, I'm con contributing millions of dollars to the tax base of this city, and you can't support me. And I'm disgusted by it. A couple of things I want to add is in some of the infill projects that we've already previously done, <clears throat> one in, in particular on Oak Lawn between 48th and 47th, we uh, purchased those lots which had no water and sewer. We had to bear the burden of that to the tune of $68,000. When you average an eight or nine, say $10,000 profit on a home, and there was three homes that went in there, and, and I make $30,000 on three homes, but I have to pay 68,000 to put the water and sewer in. Our expense for a city-owned infrastructure utility there, there's no fairness in that. Another thing I want to point out is we've got four homes under construction right now on Lakeview Heroes Boulevard. And I don't know how many years it's been since Lakeview Heroes was expanded and paved and curbed and guttered. But water and sewer was not extended to our four lots. And right now we're looking at a $98,000 extension to, to extend water and sewer to four lots. That's, that's part of the development. That's what we've been had thrown in our face We've got another four lots that we had to extend sewer to on 49th Street. When we extended it, it, it went in front of these six, six lots that we're trying to turn and, and utilize that 48,000 that we spent on four lots on 49th Street. So we've put an investment in to this community. We went into this community when no one was building over there. No one was willing. One other thing I might share with you, New Home has been invited to other cities to bring this product, this affordable home product to their city by their civic leaders. And what are they willing to do for New Home to get New Home in there and build an affordable homes for them, a quality product that makes the dream of home ownership a reality for people that normally wouldn't have them? They build the infrastructure to us. They waive the permit and the planning fees. They waive the tap fees. They give us a portion of the sales tax back at the end of the year on the dollars we spend in their city building their affordable housing. What do I get from you? I get nothing. Thank I you. get absolutely nothing. Thank you, Mike. One last thing I wanted to add from Ms. DeWitt, just FYI, any expenses that we pass on to the home buyer, um, Let's just say we had a $16,000 expense and we add that to the price of a home and we, we pass that to the buyer. There's a, probably about a 90% uh, possibility that that home won't appraise. I mean, they're, they're only gonna appraise for what the value is of similar homes in that area. So that's something that we also will always have to look at. Thank you very much. Any questions? Thank you. We have a motion on the floor, a second. Any further public comment? With no further comment, Lane has a motion on the floor to accept. Please, if you uh, would. Move to accept the appeal to allow uh, Mr. Progress. There's a second. All in favor, say aye. 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 Any opposed? Aye. One opposed motion passes. The requirements to build those streets have been denied. Have, or the, the, appeal the, been the appeal has been accepted. You will not be required to build those streets. We'll move on to item E. Consider a resolution designating the number of votes to be cast for each nominee for the Board of Directors of the Tom Green County Appraisal District. Julia, you're on, girl. Yes, um, at our September 17th meeting, we decided to keep our votes towards all of the incumbents. So we do have 1,293 votes to be split between five candidates. Um, what I would recommend is just splitting them evenly with the um, three remaining votes, either going to maybe the newest board member or the oldest board member, but um, it's 
definitely your preference, but there's 1,293 votes that were allotted. I make a motion that we split the votes evenly and the remaining three votes go to our newest um, uh, person on that board, who I think is Candy. That's correct. And so I make that motion. Do I have a second? Second. second. All, any public comment? With none, we'll take a vote. All in favor, say aye. 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 None opposed. Um, you have your votes. Thank you. And number, um, no number, letter F, discussion and possible action related to animal services, $25 annual pickup fee. And Morgan, you're on again. I know that Harry <coughs> and Luce, I mean, I know several people, Tommy, have had real issues with this conversation, so I'm interested to hear how we can resolve it. Sure, so just some background information to um, bring everybody up to speed. We often talk about a $25 pickup fee, but to really clarify in the, in the fee schedule, um, there are actually three different animal pickup fees. One is for estray livestock, which is a bigger discussion I'm working with um, city attorney on. One is animal pickup at owner's request, so that's something you would, if it's really kind of a defunct program service we don't offer anymore um, where if somebody is wanting to give up their own dog, they call and say, hey, come get my dog. Um, and then the last is the one that we're going to focus on today. Uh, that's the removal of dead animals, including livestock, of $25. So um, this was approved by council in May 2016. Um, as part of the annual fee review, uh, this is for carcasses located on private property, whether owned, stray, wild. Uh, this would include everything from deer to cats. Um, so there's no fee, of course, for carcasses in the public right of way. Um, if the citizen prefers not to pay the fee, we do offer that they may dispose of it in their refuse container. Um, and we do get questions about the spread of disease and what they could be exposed to. And um, we can drill more into that if that's something that's desired by the council. Um, and so I kind of left this open for discussion. The main takeaway is that this this and all my other fees are scheduled for fee review, which launches in January 2020. Uh, there's a number of services we offer, a number of fees that we uh, levy that are just no longer services we offer. So we're looking at uh, which services needed to be cut, which need to be expanded, uh, what increases or decreases need to happen with fees. So we do recommend that we take any action on the pickup fee with all the those other items because I really think they lean on each other. Also, leaning on the fee review process will help us um, uh, let us do that work of the cost of service calculator and providing all of that, as well as a survey of benchmark cities, what other folks are doing. Um, so as I mentioned, we can talk, discuss wherever the, the council desires. Um, that would be staff's recommendation is to um, hold off. I know that y'all are getting lots of calls about um, pickups, this is that time of year. It does seem to be a particularly um, busy uh, se season. Last year, I don't remember getting this many calls for service. Um, it is something that we're unfortunately forced to prioritize uh, when it comes to bite cases and cruelty cases uh, coming first. Of course, animal services primary function, we exist to prevent the spread of disease from animals to humans. Um, and so I am your local rabies control authority. Rabies is what I'm trained on. There are a number of other zoonotic diseases that can be transferred from um, animals to humans. Lar largely, um, that is um, not an issue in deceased animals. Once an animal has died, uh, those uh, diseases die almost instantly with that animal. And so I did, as I mentioned, I'm your local rabies control authority, and so I'm trained in rabies um, disease and how it um, transfers. But there are the other zoonotics, I generally just refer to our state veterinarian because uh, certainly I'm not that trained in the others. I did reach out to him to talk about other zoonotics um, that you could be exposed to, and he stated, by and large, in a deceased animal, you're really not going to be exposed to um, dangerous diseases. Well, I think the big issue is people are afraid to call in if a deer gets hit and left on the road because that person who calls in is then made to pay the fee for removal of that animal, and yet it's just laying on the street with flies and everything else going on. So the question mark is how do we ensure that these carcasses don't lay out there for days rotting away because someone's scared to call? And I know that Tommy and Harry have some specific comments and, you know, to add to this, so would you please, Harry? Sure. 
Thank you. You know, the, my issues really is this. We talk about no fee in the public right away. Now, if I was a homeowner and I had a fox or a squirrel or whatever was in my, you know what I'd do? I'd put my gloves on and I would drag it right out into the street. Bottom line is, I don't think most people are gonna do that. So my perspective is, I can wait until January till we have a review of this, but I think we really need to look at this wild animal and, and that fee situation because people expect that as part of the services of, of the city. So I can wait till January. I mean, the wild animal is the, the thing that, that I had the calls over. I, I haven't had any calls about domesticated pets. And I understand maybe one reason for having a fee, you might get calls or you may get a lot of calls for your folks to come pick up domesticated um, pets, which I could see having to pay a fee for that. But maybe we tweak our policy or our procedure or our ordinance or whatever to say we, you know, will not pick up domesticated pets without a fee, but if it's a wild animal, and we'd have to give some definition to that, then we'll come pick those up. Because I understand people, if it's a deer, it's pretty hard to move a deer. Um, Particularly when they're dead, they're yeah. dead weight, yeah. as they say. Yeah, so maybe that's a little direction for you all, Morgan, on, on whether it's the ordinance that needs to be reviewed, maybe, or our policy, whatever. Um, is on, on wild animals that are in someone's yard or on even maybe even in the right of way, but half on, half off. I had a couple of those that you were gracious and responded and helped. So Lucy has a comment she'd like to make her a question. Harry, what was that lady that called you? What was that? She was in the Paul Ann district. Yeah. She had a dead fox in her That's in her right. yard. It was a fox. And in in her comment to me was that she had contacted uh, Animal Services and they explained to her that there was a $25 charge. Uh, she said it's no longer dead? <laughs> <laughs> no. What I did was I, had, I made the phone call and simply told Morgan, we need to get the, that animal picked up. I said, if I need to pay it, I'll pay it. But I said, that lady needs to have that fox out of her yard. And, and that's the whole thing, it. Morgan, is that when these wild animals come into your yard, I don't feel that I'm responsible to have to pay y'all to come pick it up. I mean, if it dies in my yard. That's what I'm saying. So that's something that I will agree with the guys that I don't think that we should have to make our constituents pay $25 if a wild animal comes and dies in your yard with well, that. There was a, a deer that was hit on uh, Bryant Boulevard and Avenue D that laid in the street by a parking lot for how many days? Four days, and I can't even tell you what that looked like because no one wanted to claim it and pay the fee. Mayor? <laughs> Mayor? Yes, if sir. If I could, there are a couple of aspects that uh, I've talked to, uh, Bob Solace and I have talked about. There are two issues. One has to do with the fee and picking up the animal. The current um, strategy is rooted in a little bit uh, similar to a code situation. Uh, Councilman Carter and I were working on a situation where somebody put something in somebody's yard. Does that create a public burden? Were they mad at their neighbor? Uh, <laughs> um, it, was a <laughs> it was promotional information that was being delivered into their yard. Did that, does that, is that littering, does that create a... The, the root principle is that when something appears on private property, it does not automatically create a public burden or a public entity burden to remove that. And that is the root principle behind charging for wild animals. The, this entity didn't put that animal there. Uh, so unless this board says it's our obligation, it's not our obligation. So removing wild animals, in order for that to become our obligation to remove them from public property, 
we need you to declare that uh, as in the public interest. The private property. I'm sorry, from yeah, private pri property. Thank you. The other side is uh, we talked about priority of services and staffing. Um, uh, we're seeing, we're hearing the calls. We're seeing an, an increased uh, outcry for removal of dead animals, both on the street and on private property. And so we talked about that, and Bob pointed out that with the existing staffing, if we dedicate more time to removing dead animals wherever they are, that's going to slow some of those other services down. And, uh, of course, staff will implement that mix of services however council wants it to happen. We want you to know that if we spend more time, bump that priority up, which we hear the outcry for, uh, that could slow down some of those other services that they offer. And as well, long as you're good with it, without asking for additional personnel. Of course, we go in with the assumption we don't want to increase personnel. But We're not going to increase personnel, but we need to deal with the issue of who is responsible and is there a fee attached to removal of a dead animal. And I would say the following, we need the dead animals to disappear. Mm -hmm. So if it means creating an ordinance, I guess that's what you're asking. Do we want to create an ordinance that says dead wild animals will be picked up by the city at no expense? Is that what I'm hearing? Do I have support I would, yes, for that? I, yes, I would, I would say wild animals in someone's mm -hmm. yard, yes. Because that would go to Morgan's point about uh, communicable, transferable diseases. Of well, so the, the prevent the spread of disease, we're focusing on human bites, bites bite animals. We're just talking about dead animals. For dead right animals, now. it's not a spread yes. of disease issue. Okay. okay. We're talking dead animals, period. So it's, okay. it's not a public health issue, okay. which is our primary um, service, so we're going to have to deprioritize some of those items to address this if no additional staff or, for example, a contractor. I know there's somebody private in town that does do it for more than the $25. I get the citizens' calls from uh, saying, well, someone else said they do it for $45, and I'd say, well, it sounds like I'm a bargain at $25. So um, there are options there, but if with an existing staff, we certainly would have to stop doing something else during this, this busy season. It's all about priorities. Dead animals are a priority. So um, that's what we need to hear, Mayor. We need to know. Dead what your animals priority are a priority. Is. They they rot. They stink. They create flies. They create problems. Dead animals need to be a priority. We need to get them removed as fast as possible. So, Tommy, is that a motion? If so, please state it. Just oh, this is a discussion. This is a discussion, I think. Yeah, yeah. That, that's just, we'll I guess, for Morgan's training. information we'll during the feed. Yeah, process. you'll second the conversation. Yeah. Okay, there's a second on that conversation. A third. A third. Already third. How about a fourth and a fifth? I think we have direction. But, but I believe we we want to we want to make sure that we have this discussion in January when we discuss fees. Mm -hmm. Even if we don't take action today on this specific subject, uh, and I'm okay <laughs> pushing it for to the January meeting. But the bottom line is, is I, I think we need to address it. And people, homeowners, do not need to pay that fee for wild animal carcasses that are in their yard. Or I'll tell you what will happen. That will happen just like I, I would do it. Now, I can dispose Get of Get your others. gloves on again. <laughs> well, and to offer, I'm not saying it's at the January City Council meeting. The fee review begins in January with budget staff support for all the back work I mentioned about surveying benchmark cities, calculating cost of service, all of that. Let's just talk about one thing. Do we want a fee on dead animals and someone's private property? If it's a domesticated no. animal that's on a um, person's property, then I would expect that feed to happen. I had a pet that passed this this last weekend, and, and and I was willing to you know pay that particular fee. Now it happened to belong to my son, and he made a different decision, and he, he decided he wanted the ashes out on his property in Fredericksburg. But that's okay. I was willing to do that. But I don't think uh, homeowners should be burdened with a $25 fee because they've got a fox or a skunk or whatever else in their yard that's dead. I mean, I just don't, don't believe that we want to do that. And if I could clarify, the calls for service we get are not for owned pets ever. If somebody is calling about their own dog that died in their backyard, uh, they are not calling us to come and retrieve exactly. it. Exactly. So this when is wild animals. Most it's not wild animals. The most common call we get is for deceased cats. 
So that's a domestic animal. Well, for feral cats, we consider them wild, but I don't know once it's de deceased if it was feral or not. But if we're not going to charge the fee for domestic animals, then that citizen would still have to pay a $25 charge for the pickup of a cat that is not their cat. And so unfortunately, once an animal is deceased and it's not a public health concern, uh, we consider it refuse. It goes in our dumpster, it goes in the, the citizen's trash receptacle, whatever it is. And so unfortunately, it, we, we liken it to, you know, if there's a par raucous party in your neighborhood and someone throws a beer can in your front yard, that's not your trash, but you sure pick it up because you have a pride of ownership in your property. So if a cat that's not your cat dies in your yard, do you pick it up and throw it away or do you pay me the $25 fee? Certainly an option, but it, it's refuse either way. It's not a public health concern. It's a citizen's preference about their pride of ownership in their property. We're talking wild animals. So yeah, domestic pets that are not owned by the citizen, yeah. they would still have to pay the fee. Morgan, as far as wild animals, um, I know that this time of the year we see more as, as development occurs and it, you know brushes cut back and what have you. You do start to see more deer, more animals out there. How often do you actually, on average, on a monthly basis, do you get a call for a wild animal on somebody's yard? Well, or it could be in the quite street. Frequent. Yeah. Quite frequent then? I just want to make sure that we establish Maybe there's a number up there. We probably in, had five to eight yesterday. Oh, okay. But are those, those five to eight phone calls weren't all on private property. Some of them were on the streets. That's correct. Yeah, I'm asking so, about I mean, private property. That's the point. This isn't just about mm -hmm. private property. It's about the number of animals in the streets. Well, the majority of calls I get from council member Hebert are in this public right of way, because we would consider the curb so many feet in. That is um, public right of way. Yeah. And so that is still at no charge. But it is there is some legal concern about city staff going on private property and performing some sort of service. Even the water department start, stops at the meter, and then that's the customer side. And so uh, to go on private property and offer that service, it certainly isn't a fee we levy a lot. Um, so an average citizen calls in, hey, I've got a dead cat in my yard. And we say, great, it's a $25 fee. Well, I don't want to pay the fee. I'll just dump it in the street. And we say, well, we advise that you could be charged with illegal dumping if you do that. That is not appropriate. And every one of those citizens opts to throw it away themselves and does not call us to pick it up. We cycle by later. It's not in the right of way. It gets resolved. And so that gives us the tool to allow our staff to focus on the things that that are mandated by the state health code, mandated by the city ordinance. So to remove that fee for any level of, of deceased animal on private property does continue to have the concerns about the liability of providing city service on private property, if we go on private property. Um, we'll see in January. Mayor, yes, Mayor yes, sir. That, that process could take a few months, and we won't get the solution you desire. If you desire to waive that fee, we won't get that solution in January unless we decide today to bring the ordinance back for update in January for that item. So I I'm want the ordinance brought back in January for an update. We need to deal with this now. That's the direction I wanted. Also, I'm hearing that picking up dead animals is a priority, whether on the street or not, and that we need to bump that up in the priority and not let them sit. Well, to me, it's a huge priority because dead animals create a huge problem. And, you know, when you ask me to set it as a priority, I would take a dead animal that is rotting away collecting smells and things, bugs and flies and things, would want to be a high priority. But I can't tell you if I, you know, I don't know what the other long list of priorities are, but yes, I'm going to say this is the number, get them dealt with. Mayor, uh, we don't need an ordinance to change that. That's an internal policy action, and we will uh, develop a, a strategy in accordance with that priority and implement it uh, as soon as we, as soon as practical. It would be one reading before council to edit the fee schedule that's in a resolution. That's correct. We'll have to modify the fee policy you adopted, but we can get that done at the first meeting in January. It'll Please be a very do. Easy fix. Get and her then, done. And we will adjust the internal policy associated with priority for dead animals. Perfect. And I'm going to say we're taking a break yes, right thanks, now. Good. So we are finished with item F. When we come back in 10 minutes, we'll be with item G. Excellent. I was going to ask you. Back to order at 10:54 a.m. And we will start with item G, which is consider ratifying COSA DC's resolution authorizing the use of sales and use tax funds in an amount not to exceed $36,000 to provide an economic development incentive to centurion planning and design. And we have Shannon Scott here Mayor, to do. And I know, Tommy, you wanted to recuse yourself. I need to recuse so, myself from okay. this item.
Good morning, Mayor, Council. Uh, as Mayor Gunter stated, this is a uh, ratification for a resolution for Centurion Planning and Design uh, for a business retention and expansion project that was approved by the City of San Angelo Development Corporation Board at their uh, meeting last month. Uh, so Centurion Planning is a civil engineering firm that provides project management services uh, that includes airports, municipalities, and business and industrial parks. Uh, their expansion will include the purchase of a new office building downtown, uh, which will be located at 19 West Borgard, uh, and that is going to be in Councilman Thomas's district. Uh, currently, they have six full-time employees, and they anticipate, anticipate hiring at least three, but up to six additional employees within the next three years, uh, with those em employees having an average salary of $102,000. Uh, for the purchase of the building, as well as renovations, furnitures, fixtures, and equipment, uh, they plan on expending $500,000 uh, in capital investment. Did we miss a zero on that? Yes, ma'am. I just saw that. <laughs> My apologies. <laughs> As far as the incentives that we're proposing, we are asking for uh, $30,000 once that capital investment grant of the $500,000 has been made uh, for the acquisition of the building, as well as the renovations for furniture, fixtures, and equipment. Uh, of course, they must retain their current six employees. Uh, and for any additional employee hired up to the six full-time equivalents, we're uh, requesting $1,000 uh, per FTE. So the total incentives that we're requesting are $36,000. And of course, for every uh, project that we run across, we have to run an economic impact analysis to gauge our return on investment. Uh, in this particular case, we're looking at a 2.1 million annual economic output, uh, 1.2 million in gross annual product annually, and then a payback period of 6.2 years. Um, do I have questions for Shannon from Harry? Do you have a question? Uh, no, I think this is a great deal. I, I, I'm glad that Centurion is able to start the expansion project. Do I have any further questions from anyone? Where is the building at 19 um, West Borgard? Where is that building? It is, um, David, do you want to? I'll, I'll defer that to David Chadburn Alexander. and South Irving. Yes, David Alexander with Centurion. Um, it's basically right across from 01 Ale House in that block on the okay. library okay. between Fuentes okay. and, and the library. Okay. Thank you. It always help when we give directions referencing a bar. <laughs> restaurant yeah, and bar. Now we know where it's at. Restaurant and bar. Billy knew yeah. right where it was. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, I know. <laughs> <laughs> you got to remember that, Shannon, when you uh, move to maps, approve. Right? Let's move to approve. <laughs> Lane they have really good hot approve. wings, Tom. Harry seconds it. All in favor say aye. 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 None opposed. Motion passes <laughs> 6 0. Oh. Would someone tell Tommy to come back in, please? Um, did you hear me? Zero, zero. L House had really good hot wings. So try them next time you're there. He doesn't get past the bar. <laughs> Item H is consider ratifying Cosa DC's resolution authorizing the use of sales and use tax funds in an amount not to exceed $1,057,300 to provide an economic development incentive to Ethicon Incorporated. And Shannon, you're on again. Thank you. Uh, again, this is another business retention and expansion project that we are requesting a ratification from council that was approved by the City of San Angelo Development Corporation. Uh, to begin with, Ethicon specializes in the manufacturing of medical, surgical sutures, and wound closure devices. Uh, they would like to retain 475 full-time employees uh, having an average salary of $65,750. Uh, they do anticipate investing uh, approximately $25.95 million over the next three years uh, to include new production machinery and equipment, software, uh, and various facility enhancements. And their location is at 3348 Pulliam Street, uh, which is in Councilman uh, Woman Gonzalez's district. When we say retention of 475 full-time employees, for what time period is that? Uh, that will be from three years that the contract is executed. So they must retain those for three years. <clears throat> this, uh, this incentive package is a little different than what you're typically used to seeing. Uh, typically, we will do some sort of capital investment grant, job creation grant. Uh, in this case, um, an Ethicon representative reached out to us and requested this particular um, 
incentive package to include a, a property tax rebate. So again, just like all the rest of the projects that we do, we run them through an analysis to see, engage our re return on investment. Uh, and the incentives that they were, re were requesting, we were actually able to, to justify. Uh, so I'd like to explain that a little bit uh, and how this is gonna work out. So as far as a property tax rebate, we can do that up to 10 years. We obviously try to stay underneath that. In this particular case, it's gonna be a nine-year, uh, actually a seven-year agreement, but over the course of nine years, and I can explain that if y'all have questions. Um, really what they wanted to do is kind of phase in their we'll capital. stop right there, because I think you need to explain that. It's seven years over nine years. That's pretty complicated to describe that. Okay, so what they wanna do over the course of three years is make their capital investment, but they have three years to make that capital investment, if that makes sense. So say in year three, they start year one of the capital investment, so that would start their clock. So year three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. So that's seven years, but it can be drawn out over the course of nine years. Does that make sense? Not really, but. Okay, and I'll, I can show you <laughs> how we figured that uh, in a minute, but typically in any case. Um, I do have a quick question. No matter when they make the investment, the abatement or rebate period is seven years, right? Yes, sir, that's, that's correct. That's key. I, I, so they have a nine-year window to make the investment, but the rebate is only for seven years, which would only start after the project is complete or in the process of, because if they spend $10 million the first year, $2 million the next, and, and $12 million the third year, the rebate is, it's not property tax rebate, it is sales tax rebate? This would actually be a property plant and equipment. Okay, so, so it's a tax. property ownership, not property real estate. Yes, ma'am. equipment. Mm -hmm. So in this particular case, the way that they wanted to do it, they wanted to split the 25.95 million over three years. Um, so year one, they, they would anticipate an $8.2 million investment. Um, and once that is made, based on the 75% of that investment, uh, here's the number that we came up for that year one incentive amount, which is the 47,724. So essentially, and I believe in your background packet, you should have an Excel spreadsheet uh, with the breakdown of all of the... Um, yeah, but this is a public meeting, so let's go over it this way. Okay, so continuing on, again, here are the estimated incentive amounts based on that 75% rebate per investment for those years. So here's year one through three, and then years four through nine. That's on, I repeat, personal property taxes, not real estate taxes. That's correct. So essentially, uh, the proposed incentives, years one through nine, uh, assuming, so say they make the investment in year one, that would start their clock and it would be seven years. If it's year two, that would start the clock, but it would go through year eight. Does that make sense, how that staggering effect could occur? Okay. So the total uh, proposed incentives is going to be one million fifty-seven thousand and two hundred and three dollars. Uh, again, as far as a return on investment, the economic impact we're anticipating twenty-three point three million in annual economic output, uh, nine point three million in gross annual product, and a payback period of seven point five years. Um, I would be happy to answer any questions. We have uh, the plant manager Ray Gonzalez from Ethicon is here as well. Uh, is Jonathan Ferguson, who was with Ryan LLC, who was their taxpayer representative. My question would be for you, because it um, on the 475 full-time employees that they're going to retain, why is it not retain those employees for the length of this tax rebate or the seven to nine year period versus just a three year period? That's typically how we construct our agreements, is that they just must have a retention um, of the three years, which would capture the three years that they would have to make the capital investment. But if they don't start till year two, because I mean, you, if you look at the tax rebate and the number of years you're going, you're spreading it over, you would just think that you would spread the retaining of employees over that same time period because you would hope that those two things mesh together to create the bigger successful plant that they are. Correct. And if we need to structure the agreement to where they must continue to report for the duration of the contract, we can do that. Because we want them 
to be successful, and we love the fact that they're willing to reinvest back into this community and, to, and, and into their business. So sure. that's such a positive <coughs> step. But we really want to retain 475 employees for a very long period of time. Questions from council? Comments from council? Shannon? Um, this 475 full-time employees, is that what they have now? or is I actually believe, Jonathan, do you want to? Or, or Ray, is it Ray here? Good morning. Ray Gonzalez, plant manager for Ethicon, uh, mayor, city council. Uh, to answer your question, we, we have, um, if you look at directly what we have supporting our manufacturing uh, aspect of our plant, it's about 475, yes. We have other, you know, it varies from week to week, month to month, and we have other support contractors that are in and out of the plant, but core, that's the number. Would this expenditure, the 25 million on additional machinery, et cetera, be something that would help pull more business back out of Mexico, back into San Angelo? Is that the purpose, or is it just that we need to upgrade our current equipment mm -hmm. just to continue with the business that you have now? It's more of the second. It's more mm -hmm. of the retooling and recapitalization that keeps us competitive, because we are in a very competitive landscape, right. as you know. So it's something that we've, you know, with the partnership with the city, we've had We've had some some really strong success of bringing uh, jobs into the into the plant. Uh, uh, really, actually, from uh, recently from a, a plant that was in, located in Scotland. Um, so that's been great. Uh, we just want to stay aggressive and, and and make sure we're doing things to stay competitive and have the technology to do that. I like that. I think mm -hmm. that statement's very strong and and certainly um, is important to San Angelo. Thank so you. thank you for that. Thank you. Question, Lucy? No. No. I was just going to make a motion to then do it. present it. Go ahead. Do it. Second. seconded by Tommy and public comment. No public comment. We'll take a vote. All in favor and supportive, um, please say aye. Aye. With none opposed, motion passes 7 0. We will move on to item I, which is consider allocating up to $100,000 for capital projects from the Civic Events Fund balance for facility improvements. Sydney, I hope this is a river stage. Good morning, Mayor. Good morning, Good morning. Council. <laughs> He's not going to answer that. <laughs> I know, I know. First, I want to do an overview for the facility improvement projects that we completed in uh, FY19 first. So to start off in the facility improvements at the El Paseo, we did complete the protective netting, um, as you can see, and then the LED lighting, too, as well. We did have some savings in both of those projects. We still have one project. Well, of course, this is a picture of just showing the netting and the LED lighting as well. We is still that have, before or after? This is after, ma'am. Oh. And we still have uh, one project that's still on the books, which is the seal coating, which is still estimated at 65000 We anticipate to be completed with that summer of 2020. So we still have that project that was from last year or from this year. Moving forward, these are FY20 recommended facility improvements, which include the LED lighting replacement for the convention center, sound system replacement as well over here at the convention center, um, restroom remodel for the river stage, as well as the concession and ticket booth as the, at the river stage, and then fixing the drainage repair as well. Um, all of these items total the estimated cost of $100,000. Our fund balance currently is at a million five, um, so we do have the funds available. Just looking for a recommendation. I mean, just looking for approval from you all. With a fund balance of the million five six six, Sydney, is there, if you go back to your um, previous slide, and we talk about, for example, the river stage, is there, are there projects other than the three that you're recommending that you would consider high priority for the river stage? at this point? Currently, we're working on just maintenance items right now, and then we want to be able to bring back everything else to you all for. To go along with that topic, um, Al uh, Torres is working with us on sort of a master plan associated with that, which would be what Sid is talking about. Okay. It'll come back to you. Terrific. Other questions or comments for Sydney? Yes, Harry? Just want to make sure that I've got clarification. If you'll back up one slide, that one right there. That was something that we've already approved at some time in the past and yes, will be accomplished sometime 
in 2020. Yes, sir. Y'all approved it in April of last year. I mean, of this year. Sorry. That one's already bid. Um, that's a question for. It's it's going with Shane. Yes, sir. So it's they're running it under Shane's umbrella because he does all. He'll couple it with all the other paving. Is that sixty-five thousand dollars already taken out of the fund balance dollars, or it's still incorporated in that? We still have. We it's outside of the fund balance. Yeah. Great. We have it in our budget. Any other questions for Sid at this point? I think we want that $100,000 spent. So do I have that motion? Move, Move to approve as presented. Moved and seconded. Moved by Lucy, seconded by Tommy. And um, do we have any public comment? No public comment. We'll take a vote. All in favor, say aye. Aye. With none opposed, motion passes 7-0. Um, may I just ask what time frame, I forgot to ask you this before, what time frame are we looking to make those improvements to the river stage and then also that LED lighting? So with the river stage project, we're actually trying to get that done between December and February before mm -hmm. we have our, uh, before the start of the river stage season for us. So that's why we wanted to bring this earlier than what we did in, uh, since from last year. And then the convention center uh, LED lighting, we already have bids for those, so we're just trying to... Uh, we actually have a quote on those, so we're actually moving forward with that, and I'm hoping we have that done um, in the early part of 2020. Okay, thank you. All right, we'll move on to item J, second reading of an ordinance amending the budget for the fiscal year beginning October 1, 2019, and ending September 30, 2020, for capital items, donation, grants, and projects. Good morning, Mayor, Council, Good morning. Mr. Valenzuela. Tina Dersky, Director of Finance. Um, I'm bringing to you the second reading of a budget amendment on your direction. Normally this would be on the consent agenda, but you did request us to bring it back due to an update for the Bradford area project. Um, and so I'll go through this very quickly since you've already seen it, but please do let me know if you have any questions on it. Uh, budgeting for police canine revenue, there was a donation received, so um, budgeting for the corresponding expense there as well. Uh, budgeting for a police grant, um, and some of that uh, grant is going uh, to be split with the county, so budgeting for both of those expenditures. Budgeting for bond proceeds for um, the Hickory expansion project in the water department. Budgeting for machinery and ve vehicles from the stormwater funds fund balance. This is a planned use of the fund balance and it's been built up for this Was purpose. part of that machinery the sweeper? <clears throat> Yes. Shane is indicating yes. Okay, so I'm just confused because this was the sweepers. We talked about it last time. I get it. But there's on here another sweeper for approval. And the Mayor, carryovers. Mayor, they didn't want to get authorization for that until you had authorized the money for it. So they placed it behind the budget amendment. Is that normal? So it is it, the same sweeper then. It is. They needed okay. the funding authorized before they could um, ask for approval of the actual so it's purchase. it's not one more sweeper on top of what we approved? That's correct. Okay. All right. Okay. Um, budgeting for the Bradford storm recovery effort. Of course, this amount is being contributed by the Development Corporation to assist with the, that neighborhood um, and other areas throughout the city as available. Just a minute. You know, on that item, actually, yes. we had to put a hold um, on two particular items that were on the agenda this time around, which pertain to this item, and one that we'll be bringing back in January. I think we're getting ahead of ourselves that we if we actually move forward with approving that at this point. So this is we asked to move that to the January meeting. Yes, sir. We're just bringing it back because, of course, it was on the first reading, and mm -hmm. so we can just eliminate this. Until actual then. line item from the budget amendment, if that's your direction. Until January? Yes, ma'am. Uh, that'll just need to be part of the motion. Okay. Okay. Okay, and this is the beginning of our, our carryovers. Um, this is the money that is requested by departments to be carried over after the end of fiscal year 19 because they had projects either approved or in progress um, at the end of the year, and so they're asking to carry over the funds to use them in the current fiscal year. The first is for the city clerk um, covering the cost of two elections as we usually only budget for one election. Um, the second is for facility maintenance um, in the second floor um, East Mezzanine, or first floor East Mezzanine um, for the wooden roll down door and capital improvements um, over the kitchen area in that room. Uh, the GIS is requesting $9,000 for a new data server. Traffic is carrying over $260,000 for signal detection upgrades. Street and Bridge requesting to carry over almost $1.4 million to continue their street maintenance and application projects. 
Parks um, has installation of new gas lines um, from their headquarters building in the amount of almost $29,000. Recreation requesting $5,000 for transportation fees from the school district. Um, Recreation also requesting $150,000 to install air conditioning units um, at Carl Ray and Southside Recreation buildings. Animal Services requesting almost $19,000 for their spay neuter release pilot program, as well as $3,000 for a back order of supplies that they had um, ordered. <clears throat> and then Fire is requesting um, almost $96,000 for Microsoft software and hardware upgrades to computer equipment. State Office Building requesting to carry over $175,000 for ongoing repairs and improvements at that site. Airport is requesting $10,000 to carry over for insurance deductibles for the new roof. Water is requesting $12,000 carryover for vehicle outfits for vehicles that had already been purchased. Water reclamation, same $8,500 for the same purpose. And then the Deve Development Corporation is requesting to carry over the $178,000 they had left over in their future projects account. Can we go back because <coughs> yes, the state, no, no, state, oh, I'm, I'm sorry. sorry. I just meant to stay there before you move on. So okay. on the state office ongoing repairs and improvements for $175,000, what's the hold up here? I mean, we're in December of the new year, so this was budgeted sometime last. Typically, those are, and we'll have to consult with Bob and get back with you on that, but typically Bob takes those, and those will be a variety of things that are, that are going on there. So they may use those over time to do tile and carpet and various other things or things that each of the agency comes to him and states, these are a list of things we need done. So it may be being done over time as those agencies bring. I'll have to give you an and, update. Yeah, because I would think that that was what we approved already for the repairs that we knew needed to be done. So I'm concerned why we did that the, if we aren't doing them. <clears throat> This would be additional repairs or maintenance projects because what you had already approved in the past, we would, um, through the budget ordinance, be able to carry over automatically. So these are additional projects. Okay. That answers it. Yeah. Yes, Billy. Um, Tina, could you go back one slide on this um, animal service spay neuter release pilot program? I thought we had contracted that with um, Contra Valley Paws for our spay I'll ask neuter Morgan to to come up and answer that question. Thank you for that question. The, um, the spay neuter release program is the spay and neuter of um, community cats. So these are feral cats that come into the shelter. We spay neuter them and return them to the field. That's not an item we contract with Contra Valley Paws for. It's a city um, program because the intake is at the city site. We won't need any of those surgical supplies that we donated earlier for, for this program? Yes, ma'am, that's correct. The, uh, the surgical supplies are if we perform surgeries um, at the shelter facility itself, which we don't have an appropriate surgery suite and we don't have that equipment set up. These are through private vendors paying a veterinarian to do so. We also would have to recruit professional staff uh, and veterinarians to come on site and perform the spay neuter, which has been the sticking point um, with getting spay neuters performed on the shelter facility. And what are the back order supplies? It's medical supplies. So it's antibiotics and- Blue shots. No, I'm teasing, that's, a, <laughs> that's teasing. Right, that's a revenue stream. But yeah. uh, <laughs> this is for um, our, um, uh, oh dear, it's for our fungal jungle. So, so we have we ringworm cats, cats that we are treating on the premises. And so we stocked up on supplies to implement a ringworm treatment protocol uh, because before our ringworm treatment was not in line with the Pets Alive recommended treatment. So we purchased um, lime dip and um, ointment for the fungal jungle as well as um, supplies to treat parvo in-house at our canine and feline parvo quarantine room. So it's medical supplies. Thank you. Thank you. I make a motion to approve the budget amendments as presented with the exception of the Bradford to move that to the January meeting. Second. Second. Any public comment? Hello, Council, Daniel Venezuela. Um, my name is Stephanie, I'm with Galley Community Development. And um, I'm just curious, because I haven't been at all the meetings, but the Bradford rebuilds were brought to you in September 
about all of this, and we've been working, and Katie with San Angelo Area Foundation has been working in, um, with a lot of these clients, trying to get them back in their houses and everything else. So I'm just curious why it keeps getting tabled, um, because that money not being released is holding up some of our projects. Um, this state, through our accessibility program, um, has said we can't go in until other things are done. So we can't do our programs until some of the remodels the city needs to do is getting done. So I'm just curious why it keeps getting moved throughout. Actually, uh, we can take the blame for that. As staff was supposed to provide information for city council that w that's actually gone forward now uh, for their review. And uh, at, at this point, uh, this item will be taken to the January, January city council meeting where a decision will be made. So, but again, we're just trying to get some information from the city council that was requested. Okay. Any other further public comment? With none, we'll take a vote. All in favor, say aye. Aye. Any opposed? Motion passes 7-0. Item K, consider approving HGAC contract SWO 4-18 for the purchase of one street sweeper from Timco Incorporated in the amount of 260,895 budgeted in fiscal year 2020. Good morning, Mayor, Council, Mr. Valenzuela, Ryan Kramer with Fleet Services. Uh, this is a fairly simple item in nature and is just discussed uh, through the budget amendment ordinance. Uh, you just approved the budget for that uh, street sweeper. Uh, this item actually allows you to consider the purchase of that street sweeper through the HGAC contract, and so I would ask for your approval. Normally, this would be on a consent agenda, um, uh, but in this case, we needed it to be done after the ordinance was approved. Move approval. Move approval okay. by Tommy, second by Lucy. Any public comment? With no public comment, we'll take a vote. All in favor, say aye. Aye. None opposed. Motion passes 7-0. We'll move on to item um, L, update on sales tax revenue performance. Tina. Thank you, Mayor. Um, your report for your sales tax in December is that it was down 0.15% compared this to- This is really October sales receipt. Yes, ma'am, for sales in, in October. Compared with the same month in prior year, um, we are still over budget for revenue because you did budget conservatively uh, by over $420,000 year to date. And then here's your November sales tax by industry information as well. Professional services is way down. Tell us what professional services incorporates. Finance, insurance, real estate, legal services, scientific, educational, information service, and other professional services. We did take a look at that because it did appear to be down, and it seems that the um, sales tax for November of 2019 was right in line with 2017, and that it just spiked up in 2018 for some reason. We, aren't, we weren't able to drill down any deeper than that, but we do think it's in line with 2017, so I think just something in 2018 was up a lot higher than normal. Well, I noticed that the national average for sales tax um, or retail sales for sure in you know, nation line was only up 0.2% compared to last year's 0.4%. So we're not far off that mark. I was just disappointed to see that our um, sister cities that we compare sales tax revenue were much stronger than ours. So I was surprised by that. So with that said, we need to once again make sure that we say out loud, shop local, support local, serve local, share local. We need your local tax dollars. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you, Tina. Thank you, ma'am. We will now go to item eight, which is closed session. Executive session on the provision of government code, Title V, Open Government Ethics, Subtitle A, Open Government, Chapter 551, Open meetings, subchapter D, exceptions to requirement that meetings be open under the following sections. A, section 551.072 to deliberate the purchase, exchange, lease, or value of real property if deliberation in an open meeting would have a detrimental effect on the position of the governmental body in negotiations with a third person regarding Ford Ranch. B, section 551.0712, consult with the attorney when the governmental body seeks the advice of its attorney on a matter in which the duty of the attorney to the governmental body under the Texas Disciplinary Rules of Professional Conduct of the State Bar of Texas clearly conflicts with this chapter regarding West Texas Water Partnership. Section C, 
I mean, C, Section 551.072, to deliberate the purchase, exchange, lease, or value of real property if deliberation in an open meeting would have a detrimental effect on the position of the governmental body in negotiations with a third person regarding A, portion of G. Schubert's S-0326 Windstone Park Edition, parts of lots 1 and 10, Block C, Main Part Edition, and 141.670 plus or minus acres out of WCRR Company uh, County Survey and 200.1100 plus or minus acres out of the West Johnson Survey. And so at this moment, which is 1124, we will adjourn for um, our closed session. We'll, minutes, we'll be back at uh, 1230. We will call this meeting back to order. Um, <coughs> And um, we will start with Tom Thompson, um, and if you'll please uh, make your announcement. Please, I make a motion to extend the deadline on a lease agreement with Recurrent Energy through March 31st, 2020. Is there a second? Second. Uh, all in uh, public comment. <clears throat> with no public comment, we'll take a vote. All in favor, say aye. 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 None opposed, motion passes 7-0. And Lucy, I think you have an announcement as well. Yes, ma'am. Motion to accept two parcels of 12.398 acres and 12.88 acres, totaling 25.286 acres, located in the Windstone Park Edition. Do I have a second? And a second by Lane. Do I have public comment? No public comment. We'll take a vote. All in favor, say aye. Aye. And no, and none opposed. Motion passes 7-0. And our last item, Harry, if you'll make your announcement and your motion. Sure. Motion to authorize the city manager to negotiate and accept the following properties, a 12.6 foot by 100 foot strip of land from Freedom Fellowship Church and a 123 foot by 20 foot strip of land from Citibank. All right. Is there a second to that? Second. Um, any public comment? No public comment. We'll take a vote. All in favor, say aye. Aye. None opposed. Motion passes 7-0. Do we need to say anything else, girls? Just a minute. One moment, please. adding the numbers. Sure. All right, with that, we will move on to item B. It is consideration of approving various board nominations, the Civic Events Advisory Board, Karen Abbott, SMD1, to a second term, and Tim Condom, SMD2, to a third term, both ending December 2021. Parks and Recreation Advisory Board, Edward Dotson, SMD2, to a third term. John Mark Hogue, SMD5, to a first full term. And Steve Hampton, SMD6, to a first full term, all ending December 2021. Do I have a motion to accept those board nominations? A motion. Do I have a second? Second. Second by Tommy. Any public comment? With no public comment, we'll take a vote. All in favor, say aye. 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 Uh, none opposed. Motion passes. Item C is consideration of possible dates for a strategic planning workshop. I suggest that we make our first one on February 25th. February 25th? February 25th. Yeah. That would be the last Tuesday of the month. February 21st. 20, 25th. 25th. Oh, 25th. And that is, as I said, the um, last Tuesday of the month of February, taking into consideration Tom Thompson's stock show and rodeo. So I felt like um, if we did it the 25th, that would be good because on the 18th, we have a city council meeting. On the 4th, we have a city council meeting. The 11th is during the stock show rodeo. So I'm suggesting the 25th of February for our first workshop. Sounds good. Is that good? All right. With Eight in the morning? Uh, no, 8.30. 8.30. Oh. And so at 8.30 in the morning on the 25th, our first strategic financial workshop. Mm. Um, all of Is everybody okay with that? Do I need a vote? No, 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 okay, so no. take care of that. Okay. And Great. then announcements and consideration of future agenda items. Are there any? Yes, Teresa. Um, I do 
want to request another motion. Um, that's a motion conveying a portion of the G. Shibbets S-0326 property to the adjacent property owner and authorizing the city manager to negotiate and execute all documents related. Is there a second? Yes, yeah. yeah, and a second. Any um, public comment? With no public comment, we'll take a vote. All in favor say aye. 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 Motion passes. Do I have a motion for adjournment, please? So moved. so moved by Tommy, seconded by Lane. Um, no public comment on this item as well, so we are officially adjourned.